Welcome to this evening's Nuclear Regulatory Commission public meeting on the Waste Confidence Draft Generic Environmental Impact Statement and Proposed Rule. My name is Miriam Juckett and I will be your facilitator for this evening's meeting. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few things that has to do with the process and the objectives so that everyone has a good idea of what to expect this evening. First of all, the objective for the NRC is to hear your comments and your recommendations on the draft generic environmental impact statement. We'll be calling that the GEIS during this meeting. And the staff will be here to hear your comments, and they'll be taking these comments back to consider in the finalization of the EIS. There are many ways to submit comments on this, and you'll hear about some of that in the presentations. But we want to make sure that everyone knows that whether you submit comments in writing or whether you submit comments by speaking them onto the record tonight, all of the comments will be considered the same. All of them will be considered equally. So we do want to make sure that we get your comments tonight for the NRC staff to consider. As far as the process for tonight's evening, this evening, we will be going through a couple of very brief presentations by a couple of NRC staff members. And then we will go to a very short question and answer. We'll take two or three questions. And the main purpose of that is to make sure that everyone understands the process for finalization of the EIS, the schedule, things like that. But we'll just take only a couple of questions since the main portion of this evening's meeting is the comment portion. And that's where we'll open up the floor to people who have registered to speak and those who have walked up and said that they would like to speak. And we'll ask you to come and make your comments at the podium. Now, our court reporter over here, Ron, will be um, taking a transcript of this evening's uh, proceedings. So you'll have a chance to speak your comments on the record for consideration. When we do go to the comment portion, what I'll be doing is calling everyone's name uh, one by one. And I'll call two or three at a time. And if you could make your way to the front, and we'll um, take a couple of seats here for people to get ready to go up to the podium. Because we do have so many people signed up to speak tonight, and we're very happy that we've got a great crowd out tonight, we'll ask everyone to stick to a three-minute limit. And my colleague, Pat LaPlante here, will be holding up a little sign to remind you when you're at one minute. And that way we kind of have an idea as to how long your comment uh, is going on and that you have one minute remaining. After that one minute, I'll give you a signal and let you know to, to wrap it up. So we do want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak tonight. So I'm sorry in advance if I have to cut you off and, and let you know that your three minutes are up. But we do want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. So with that, I just want to add a couple of other housekeeping items before I introduce tonight's speakers. Um, you have a couple of forms that are on the chairs. If you didn't, we will be happy to provide you one. There's a feedback form that just lets us know how you felt about how tonight's meeting went. And you can either give it to any of the NRC staff who are here, or it's marked for you to be able to mail it in, post a tree. We also have a few comment forms so that as you're listening to the comments and maybe you already spoke or you think of something that you want to be able to say, you can write down your comments and give them to the NRC staff members and we'll be happy to take those from you. <clears throat> the other thing is the restrooms are out the door to the left right back here, just in case. We'll probably take a quick break towards the middle depending on how the flow of the meeting is going and if we're getting everyone in to speak. So with that, I want to real quickly introduce to you the NRC staff members who are here today. We have Dr. Keith McConnell, who is the director of the Waste Confidence Director. <coughs> and we have Paul Michelak, who is the branch chief in the Environmental Impact Statement Branch. We have Lisa London, who's from our Office of General Counsel. And we would be remiss in not acknowledging Susan Wittick and T.R. Rowe, who have done a lot of the logistics for this and really helped us out in getting this to be a nice smooth meeting. Also, I want to make sure to mention, you probably got to speak with some of the folks that were out here from NRC. We are only taking questions that have to do with the process, but we've made the staff available to you so that if you do have more technical comments or questions, I'm sorry, questions, that you want to go out and speak with someone about, you're welcome to at any time go talk to people out in the foyer, that's what they're there for. And we want to make sure that we keep the meeting mostly to comments, so that's why we're not going to be responding to what you say from the podium, it'll just be the comments. So with that, let's get started with our presentations, and Dr. Keith McConnell will give the first presentation. Thanks, Miriam, and good evening, everyone. 
Miriam indicated, I'm Keith McConnell, and I'm the director of what's called the Waste Confidence Director at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I want to welcome you here tonight for this, proposed, this public meeting on the proposed rule called Waste Confidence. The purpose of the meeting tonight is to gather your comments on the draft generic environmental impact statement and proposed rule for the storage of spent nuclear fuel after the operating life of a power reactor and before it's disposed of in a geological repository, otherwise called the Waste Confidence Rule. These two documents, the draft generic environmental impact statement and the proposed rule, represent the culmination of the Directorate's activities over the, the past year to respond to a U.S. Court of Appeals from the District of Columbia decision to vacate or avoid the 2010 <coughs> version of the Waste Confidence Rule and remand it back to the NRC staff uh, to fix certain deficiencies that relate to the impact analysis under the National Environmental Policy Act. <coughs> Given that the purpose of tonight's meeting is to gather your comments on this uh, draft generic environmental impact statement and proposed rule, and we, intend, we the NRC staff intend to limit what we say so that we can maximize the opportunity for you all to to uh, provide us your comments. And it's our goal to, to stay here until we hear everyone that's signed up to speak. So we do, we do encourage you to participate. As Miriam has indicated, we do have the technical staff back in the back of the room and out in the foyer who have written the vast majority of the draft generic environmental impact statement. And I encourage you to take uh, the opportunity to talk to those individuals because they will be considering your comments and they will be writing in the final draft of these two documents. I also would like to take a few minutes and talk about our rulemaking process. It's a very important part of what we do at the NRC. It's how we implement national policy and standards. It's how we maintain and achieve the NRC's goals of maintaining public health and safety and security and protection of the environment. The meeting here tonight is a very important part of that process. We're here to, get, to gather and hear your comments. So again, we encourage you to participate. Tonight's meeting, which is one of 13 uh, interactions with the public, formal interactions with the public that we're having during this public comment period, is just one of the efforts that we've undertaken to make this waste confidence rulemaking effort as open and transparent as possible. In that regard, we do appreciate those of you who participated in the scoping meetings that occurred last October and November. And also those of you that have followed along with the Waste Confidence activities uh, during our monthly public status calls. We do want to hear your comments. I would note that uh, the five NRC commissioners, uh, when they reviewed the draft generic environmental impact statement and proposed rule before it went out for public comment, specifically asked that the public comment on five uh, particular questions. And they relate to the format and content of the Waste Confidence Rule. And those questions are out on the table, and then, so you can specifically pick them up and know what they are. But we encourage you to uh, provide your comments on those questions. Those specific questions, as well as any generic comments you have, will help us improve the final documents and will provide vital information to the commissioners when they consider our final documents and how we've done in response, how well we've done to respond to public comments. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul Mitchellack, who will provide some brief introductory remarks. Good evening. I'd like to add to Keith's welcome and thank you for participating today. My name is Paul Mitchellack. I'm the branch chief of the Environmental Impact Statement Branch and the Waste Confidence Director. At tonight's meeting, I'll give a brief history of waste confidence, outline key aspects of the draft generic environmental impact statement and the proposed waste confidence rule, and explain how you can comment on these documents. Then we'll go to the public comment portion of the meeting, which is really the heart. Waste confidence accomplishes two things. It generically addresses the environmental impacts of continued storage and makes a determination about the feasibility of safe storage and the time frame for repository availability. The draft generic environmental impact statement for waste confidence 
satisfies part of the Commission's National Environmental Policy Act obligations for reactor licensing and relicensing, and the licensing and relicensing of spent fuel storage facilities. The draft environmental impact statement also serves as the regulatory basis to support the proposed waste confidence rule. The environmental impact statement and proposed rule only cover the time frame after the license life for reactor operation. However, it is important to note that the proposed rule on waste confidence does not license any particular site or facility, nor does it allow for the long-term storage of spent nuclear fuel at any site. The NRC's history with waste confidence started when the Commission issued the rule back in 1984. Since then, the rule has been updated, most recently in 2010. In 2012, the rule was challenged, and the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit vacated the 2010 rule. The Court identified three deficiencies with the Commission's environmental analysis to support the 2010 waste confidence rule. The Court found that the analysis didn't evaluate the environmental effects of failing to secure permanent disposal of the spent nuclear fuel. It also directed the Commission to provide a forward-looking assessment of spent fuel pool leaks and the environmental consequences of spent fuel pool fires. The Court did conclude that a generic approach, either with an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement, would appropriately address the issues associated with waste confidence. Following the Court's decision, the Commission directed the staff to prepare an environmental impact statement, evaluating these issues with the possibility of issuing an updated waste confidence rule. There are two things that I would like you to remember. The first is that waste confidence is just a small part of the overall environmental analysis for reactor or storage facility licensing and relicensing. <coughs> Secondly, waste, the waste confidence rule does not license any facility or authorize storage after the expiration of a facility's license. The draft statement describes the impacts of continuing to store, store spent nuclear fuel beyond the license life for operation of <coughs> the reactor, whether in a spent fuel pool or at an independent spent fuel storage installation located at both the reactor and an away from reactor site. The draft statement describes why we're revisiting waste confidence. It discusses the alternatives considered. It describes how the environmental impacts were evaluated. It describes what facilities are covered and the environmental impacts of continued storage at reactor sites and away from reactor sites. It also contains information on the cost of the alternatives to the rulemaking. It describes the cumulative environmental impacts of continued storage and it contains information on the feasibility of a repository and the feasibility of safe of spent fuel. The draft statement assessed impacts of continued spent fuel storage for three time frames based on when a repository would become available. We evaluated a short term or 60 years beyond the license life for reactor operation time frame. We also evaluated a long term time frame which was 100 years beyond the short term or 160 years. And then finally, there was an indefinite storage scenario where no repository becomes available. The draft statement serves as the regulatory basis for the proposed rule. The proposed rule would generically address the environmental impacts of continued storage. These impacts would not be revisited in future site specific licensing proceedings unless the NRC discovers something about the site that would make the application of the conclusions in the environmental impact statement inappropriate. The proposed rule would revise the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's regulations. Specifically, the citation is Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 51.23. The proposed rule also states that the analysis supports the Commission's determinations that it is feasible to safely store spent nuclear fuel following the license life for operation of a reactor. It also states that it is feasible to have a mined geologic repository within 60 years following the license life for operation of a reactor. We are specifically seeking comment on whether the final rule should contain these last two statements. 
To ensure that your comments are considered, they must be received by December 20, 2013. Mailed comments must be postmarked by December 20. All comments, whether submitted in writing or provided orally, are considered equally. Of course, we're here tonight so you can tell us your comments on the generic environmental impact statement and the proposed rule. Tonight's comments are being transcribed and will become part of the record. You can also leave written comments with the NRC staff located at the registration table. And we will make sure that those comments are added to the document. You may also email, fax, or mail your comments to the NRC. You may also provide comments using the federal e rulemaking site, www.regulations.gov. That concludes the presentation. I'll turn the meeting back over to the Thank you, Paul. Very quickly to a couple of questions, or if people have them, but we're going to, okay, we've got our mic situation worked out. Are there any questions that anyone has regarding the schedule or finalization of the rule? And could you please introduce yourself? Oh, yes, I'm uh, Jeffrey Sharp, is my name. Is there any possibility you could back the slide up one slide so we can see the exact text of what was just really described? It was only up there for a few seconds or so. Certainly, and I also want to make you aware that these slides are available outside too, if anybody would like a hard copy of the slides. That should give you the slide back. Any other questions? Will the docket be made public afterwards? I'm Mike with Chicago Independent Television. I was wondering if the official docket with all the public comments will be made available to the public or only if you will to the NRC. Certainly, let me go ahead and, and get Keith McConnell to answer that question for you. And the question was about whether or not all the documents on the docket will be made public. The answer to the question is yes. All the documents will be made public. The comments will be public. There will be a comment response uh, section in the uh, final generic environmental impact statement. And all of that information will be available on our website, the Waste Confidence website. Any final questions on process or schedule? I, I was wondering, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm Tammy Thompson. I, um, I was wondering that the spent fuel that you're talking about, will this be coming from other facilities traveling to the United to the Illinois to be stored here, or is it the waste that's already at the facilities that are here. Okay, we want to make sure that we're primarily concentrating on the um, process questions here, but we'll go ahead and take this one. This is Paul Michelak. Hi, Paul Michelak. The fuel, the spent fuel that's considered in the environmental impact statement is from com commercial reactors licensed by the United States. So the answer to your question is no. The fuel that we're considering is domestic commercial fuel if the NRC licensed the facility, that fuel is considered in generic environmental access. Sorry, but are we accepting fuel from other states into our state, or does our stuff stay here? Yeah, just keep my comment. In terms of the impacts analysis, the impacts analysis is considered what's generated on site and which is stored on site. Okay, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut this off. We have to make sure that we go ahead and get to the comment portion, but I do want to make sure that you know that we do have NRC folks available out in the lobby to speak with if you do have more questions. Um, and we'll also stick around afterwards so that you're welcome to come and, and ask these questions individually. So let's go ahead and move to the comment portion of the program. And when I call your name, please make your way up to the front. We've got a couple of chairs here for if you care to way up here as opposed to at your seat if it's a little easier to get out. Please do state your name and affiliation if you can. And also, we need to make sure that you know everybody's got differences of opinions and we'll hear a, a wide variety of things today. We would really love it if you could be polite to each other and we need to get a clean transcript for this evening's meeting. So one speaker at a time and we'll go in the order that you're called. And also, if you didn't pre-register, we're still accepting comments, you're welcome to go ahead and speak. If you could sign in at the registration desk, or if you did pre-register and you didn't get a chance to check in at the pre-registration desk, that just help us, helps us to know that you're here and you would still like to speak. So our first two speakers that I want to go to are Reed Wilson from the Office of Congressman Adam Kinsinger. Is he here? Okay, I'm not, oh, there 
And uh, next we'll go to Tom Wolf. Good evening, I'm Reed Wilson, representing Congressman Adam Kinzinger, who represents the 16th District of Illinois. Dear Commissioners, we'll let it read here. Thank you for allowing my office the opportunity to address this public meeting regarding the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's rulemaking to address waste confidence. As many Illinois residents rely on nuclear for clean, affordable energy, this rulemaking will have an important impact on consumers across the state. In the 16th District alone, there are four nuclear power plants providing grid and price stability to consumers throughout our region. Nuclear power provides half of our state's energy and generates almost 93% of the carbon-free electricity produced in Illinois. Without the availability of this base load power, there's no doubt that prices would skyrocket and energy stability would plummet. In addition, the nuclear energy uh, industry supports thousands of high-paying jobs, which in turn supports the tax base of our local communities. <coughs> We're here today to discuss the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's proposal, proposed rule on waste confidence. <coughs> The proposed rule simply clarifies the issues and processes surrounding a safe and secure storage of spent nuclear fuel. It does not authorize individual licenses, this is only one step in the Commission's National Environmental Policy Act review. Enhancing the clarity of this policy will lead to a more efficient licensing process, which will benefit consumers throughout our region. In addition, the NRC rulemaking process is a kind of open and transparent process that should take place in all aspects of government regulation. There's been widespread participation of all aspects of government, industry, and the public in order to ensure that all viewpoints are considered. A total of 12 public meetings will take place. The members of the public will have the opportunity to submit comments to the Commission through December 20th, 2013. Following the completion of this process, it is my hope that the NRC will complete this rulemaking in an expeditious manner. Lastly, I want to touch on the fact that Luther Regulatory Commission has suspended all final licensing decisions while well, this rulemaking process moves forward. I believe it's time to provide this industry, which provides a clean source of energy to millions of consumers, the ability to move forward with a greater level of certainty for the long-term operations. Sincerely, Adam Kinsinger, Member of Congress. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Tom Wolf. Good evening and thank you. My name is Tom Wolf. I'm the Executive Director of the Energy Council at the Illinois Chamber of Commerce and a proud member of the Illinois Clean Energy Coalition. It's clear from our overall that for our overall quality of life, as well as our overall economic well-being, that we need a reliable, cost-competitive, diverse, and safe supply of energy. In the past few months, I've been to public hearings on license extensions for nuclear power plants, US EPA regulations on emissions for coal plants, regulations of hydraulic fracturing in Illinois, and permitting for new transmission lines that would bring more wind energy to Illinois. Every single energy project that I was at for these community meetings for had its, detract had its detractors at these meetings. Yet no one has come to the end of the hearings with the perfect solution. Just reasons why the current system isn't perfect. Well, of course it's not perfect. Everyone in this room knows that there's no perfect form of energy. If there was one, believe me, we'd be using it. So we're stuck with an abundance of imperfect choices. But we've done pretty well with these, and I want to thank the NRC, IEMA, and IEMA for working with the owners of our nuclear facilities to keep the on-site storage of spent nuclear fuel safe. And it is safe. Unlike these scenarios that are designed to scare people or grab headlines, are not productive to this discussion, nor to our energy debate in general. Opponents of nuclear energy paint a picture of piles of growing, of glowing waste sitting out in the open air, open air, poisoning the air, or implying that they're easy targets. All this hyperbolic hot air just obscures the fact that there has never been a single incident where spent nuclear fuel storage has been compromised by any outside individual or group. It's been safely stored for decades, and I believe the NRC and IEMA and the owners of nuclear plants can keep it that way for decades to come. Of all the reasons people gave for wanting to move away from Illinois, I can say that no one has ever talked to the Chamber about the stored nuclear waste as a reason to move out of the state. The tax structure, the pension problem, the high workers' comp rates, destructive attitudes in Springfield, those are the radioactive issues that keep businesses from coming to or growing in our state. In conclusion, we certainly hope that the federal government will meet its long overdue obligation and will soon figure out a solution to the long-term storage of spent nuclear fuel. 
But until then, we are happy that the industry and its federal and state regulators have determined a strategy that works on many levels, the most important of those is our safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, let's go to David Kraft. And then let's go to Scott Fleming. And then S.Y. Chen. Good evening. My name is Dave Kraft. I'm director of Nuclear Energy Information Service. We're an environmental safe energy advocacy organization based in Chicago, Illinois. We represent nearly 900 supporters in Illinois, 34 states, and four countries. And we thank the commission for allowing us the three minutes of meaningful comment on a problem destined to haunt humankind for tens of thousands of years. We hope we've demonstrated that the people of Illinois while not on the original NRC list of sites for the GEIS public meeting, are indeed interested in radioactive waste issues after all. And we hope you enjoyed Orlando, one of the NRC's originally proposed sites, despite the turnout. You'll always have Disney World Center. So. All right, I'll use my time to summarize the main points that we're going to be uh, putting in detail in a more uh, elaborate comment, which we will put in before the deadline. The first point we want to make is that we submit that the, the GEIS, as written, is inadequate to both the task of satisfying the directives of the 2012 Court of Appeals, and it's also inadequate in protecting the health and safety of the public and the environment. For these reasons, we would ask the NRC to withdraw the current DGEIS. Second point, we believe that the moratorium on licensing of new and relicensing of currently operating reactors should remain in place until such time as a permanent, deep, geological, high-level radioactive waste disposal facility is designed, licensed, built, and in operation, not just in theory. We ask NRC to maintain this moratorium until this condition is reached, and ask that the moratorium be extended to include the siting and licensing of any temporary away from reactor storage facilities, such as those referred to as centralized interim storage facilities. It's irresponsible to continue the production of such wastes without a demonstrated and operational means of disposal. The third point, we ask that you withdraw all statements to the effect that because of NRC oversight programs, NRC asserts and guarantees that spent fuel can be stored safely at reactor sites indefinitely. Such a guarantee implies that the NRC will be providing constant oversight into that indefinite period of time. Yet, one month ago, the NRC could not even guarantee that its workers would be able to come to work the next day. The hubris of such an assertion, therefore, borders on the colossal. And finally, we find that NRC's finding of no significant impact regarding issues like spent fuel pool fires, spent fuel pool leaks, the vulnerability of the spent fuel pools and dry cast sites to natural disasters and terrorist assaults, and the NRC's belief in the adequacy of generic findings at reactors to be unfounded, inadequate to the protection of the public health and safety, and in contradiction to the NRC's own definition of what constitutes a nuclear safety culture. And I would like to quote to you from a view graph that was presented at the Palisades nuclear reactor last year. The NRC version of the safety culture is a core of values and behaviors resulting from a collective commitment by leaders and individuals to emphasize safety over competing goals to ensure the protection of people and the environment. These assertions will be elaborated on in detail in our subsequent uh, uh, submittals. So I want to thank you for having us tonight. Thank you. Scott Plumbing, uh, Will County Center for Economic Development. Um, the, uh, let me put the glasses on here. Will County Center for Economic Development is committed to creating a healthy business climate to attract businesses and jobs to Illinois. 
We know that having a competitive, safe energy infrastructure is a key part of the economic growth equation. We are fortunate to be home to one of Illinois' nuclear power generating stations at Braidwood. This facility employs nearly a thousand people and supports many thousands of additional jobs in the region. Braidwood Station pumps tens of thousands of millions of dollars directly into the area economy and invests in many worthwhile community causes. But those of us who live in and work in an area, especially someone who is looking to attract new business in the area, would not be satisfied with the uh, substantial uh, uh, economic impact if we came at this expense of our safety. The uh, Center for Economic Development is also a member of the Braywood Citizens Advisory Panel and have been fortunate to closely follow the way Braywood operates. It, uh, its culture of safety and security is second to none. And its transition to dry cast storage and, of spent fuel is a good example. Exelon took the initiative to invest in dry cast storage that provides an added level of safety and security, and we applaud them for taking that step. We also encourage the NRC to continue to work with industry to promote and innovations and that will further enhance operational safety and ultimately lead to the creation of spent fuel repository for the storage of this material. The Will County uh, CED is confident in the safety and security of the storage facilities at Braywood and we look forward to the continued positive impacts of uh, the station in our community for many years to come. Thank you. Next we'll go to S.Y. Chen. Good evening. I'm S.Y. Chen. I'm a professor, also a director of health business program at Eden Institute of Technology in Chicago. I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. I have several brief comments here uh, for the effort that NRC has done, and I just want to go over that uh, briefly. First uh, is the expectations. Confidence, we all know, is the eyes of beholders. So sitting here tonight, uh, people have different expectations of what confidence means. Certainly with the NRC scope here, it's actually very limited. We heard about limited only to the spent nuclear fuel that generated outside, but spent nuclear fuel goes much beyond that. And this is a disparity of expectation because, as we know, until and unless the spent fuel nuclear fuel becomes eligible to put in the ground in the repository, I'm not too sure how much confidence public will have. Certainly, it is not within the scope of the EIS, but however, they're interconnected. At some point, I think that uh, in a large part, either as a constraint or something, the EIS really had to mention, ultimately, there's a connection with the repository, which is unavailable, and we don't even see anything inside. So this is just a observation I have, is that what kind of confidence you have, and what expectations you come to the public to say, I have this confidence, what do you mean by that? Second, we heard about the three scenarios, about the fire or things like that. But I just tell you, what had happened in the last uh, couple of days, uh, the typhoon Haiyan happened in the Philippines, blowing 370 kilometers per hour. Uh, climate is changing. So that means, according to the prediction, a good part of the shoreline we are going to raise will be had a meter high. What happened with a lot of plants that we have here, we're going to continue to store the fuel uh, by the shore there, we're going to have problems. But I'm not too sure all these climate issues, after 60 years of operation here, that could become a reality. So are we assessing 
the potential uh, risk that involved. And that's the real issue. We really don't see that being analyzed. A uh, third point I have is actually in the EIS analysis, which I partake a lot in my career when I work at Argon, uncertainty analysis. Knowing this is generic EIS, there's a lot of assumptions coming into that. But every assumption has a lot of uncertainty involved. So I'm not too sure how exactly uncertainty has been analyzed, much more specifically. Dr. Shane, can we get you to wrap up, please? Right, okay. So that's basically what I have. And later, the last one will be the site-specific analysis, which is not part of that. How that tied into the uncertainties I mean here could be very important. And I'm studying Thank you. Thank you very much. so routinely. They're seldom reported in the news except the headlines of Braidwood. So I would take exception with how fine Braidwood's uh, track record has been, especially dumping uh, polluted, uh, irradiated water in a community uh, unbeknown to them for 10 years. Uh, in addition to leaks, we also have, uh, in recent days, learned of felonies uh, created, created by folks over at Dresden. So, Dresden. so if our if our futures are in the hands of an entity and we hear that the people that they're hiring are of this caliber, I do not have confidence. I don't have confidence in an industry that relies on our tax dollars to subsidize its own interests, long guarantees to build new reactors, expecting Main Street to invest in what Wall Street will not. Wall Street refuses to take on the risk and why should we? For that, I have no confidence. I also have no confidence when presidents and blue ribbon commissions are made up of, uh, uh, when the president's blue ribbon commission is made up of industry promoters like John Rowe, the former chairman of Exelon, and others for whom there is a clear conflict of interest in any decision making capacity. The BRC's recommendation for CIS centralized interim storage is no solution. It just puts lethal materials onto our streets and expressways and opens it to traffic accidents and terrorist attacks. Just because the statement I heard, just because we haven't had an accident yet, means that it's safe, uh, is short-sighted and unrealistic. I thank the Federal District Court for throwing us a lifeline. The nuclear power industry puts us at risk. Our families at risk, our communities at risk. Their claims of infinitesimal risk do not reconcile with a major nuclear accident happening every 10 years. Go back and do the math. You need not be a scientist for that. I taught Chicago's inner city schools for 20 years, and my third graders could do that math. 
How could anyone have even allowed one reactor to be built with no end plan for waste? Your recommendations are not a solution. There is still no end plan. Interim means indefinite. That's not a plan. Except to stockpile it beyond, in facilities beyond the capacity for which they were built. We citizens are the only ones in this room not going to pay to be here. Be mindful when you listen to the accolades of industry or politicos who've been uh, the recipients of campaign dollars in terms of listening to them. These reactors are unsafe and unreliable. They are not clean. They are not green. I have no confidence in the Price-Anderson Act because it, it's being reauthorized in 2017. It limits the nuclear power industry's liability, and it's a pittance compared to what the people in Japan are facing in trillions of dollars. Our, our accidents will be paid for by our own tax dollars, just like the loan guarantees and subsidies that are building these atrocities in the first place, and I thank you. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> so um, the NRC has a stated uh, mandate to ensure the protection of the people and the environment. And I want to uh, state here uh, in um, argument to some of the statements earlier by some of the industry folks that nuclear power is neither safe, clean, affordable, or cost effective. On the safety issue, I merely have to mention Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. And all, that's all that needs to be said about the safety issue of uh, nuclear power. Um, the clean uh, tag on nuclear power is um, absolutely ridiculous when you factor in the, um, the carbon intensive and toxicity of uranium mining in our First Nations areas across the country. And affordable and cost competitive is a joke. As um, Ms. Heddington just said, the loan guarantees and uh, the taxpayer subsidies of nuclear power should certainly be factored into every kilowatt hours that we, the hour that we think we're getting from the nuclear power plant. And I assure you that all economists agree that uh, nuclear power without federal subsidies is neither cost competitive nor affordable. But about the, um, the uh, confidence in the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission in their ability to safely store spent nuclear power uh, fuel following, following the licensed life of every operator, uh, of every reactor, excuse me, and 60 years from now, them find a safe geological repository, really, it's, it's laughable. Um, I want to just ask the audience right now, who here, right this moment, feels terrorized, terrorized of what's happening in Fukushima with the spent fuel pot? Exactly. There we go. So nuclear power is really a terrorist organization. We all feel terrorized by this. Any, an accident, a disaster can occur at every nuclear power plant. I have absolutely no confidence that the NRC has investigated every single possibility at every single power plant for fires, leaks, natural disasters, and terrorist attacks. So I, for one, and every single person that put their hand up, has no confidence in the NRC's supported, supposed environmental impact statement. Thank you. Next speaker is Rick Fox. Hello there. Uh, I'm Rick Fox. I'm here tonight uh, representing the uh, Global Warming Solutions Group of Central Illinois. Um, our group has, uh, um, had a, as long as we've existed for the last few years, focused on finding things to, uh, to address global warming on a, on a local basis. Um, we've come out and, and strongly opposed to nuclear power in general because we, we feel, despite some of the uh, the carbon arguments that they're just is not the the argument to uh, to justify the um, the issue really we're here to talk about tonight, which is our confidence in how we deal with uh, the the spent fuel and the, the hazards that we, we face with the nuclear energy. Um, my background: I have an engineering degree. Um, I'm uh, a, a software guy today, but. Uh, Know a little bit about engineering. My uh, my father's an engineer. 
Um, one of the things when, when you look at engineering projects, and this is fundamentally what the argument here is, is that uh, we can engineer our way out of, of this, uh, this issue. Um, and as was stated before, any engineering project, there's a number of assumptions, and you build something to a particular set of specifications. And I, I think that our, on, on, with this particular issue, um, you, can't, you can't set the, uh, the assumptions at a point that's strong enough to, for, for us to have confidence that, uh, um, that we can come up with a, a really a solution that would justify keeping uh, new plants being licensed. Um, in particular, I think that the uh, EIS uh, does not do enough to address the issues uh, related to, uh, to climate change and the things that may be coming along as a part of, uh, um, you know, as, as our climate is already changing, we're seeing things happening, what happens over the next uh, uh, 60 years, 160 years, and and further into the future, um, I think that uh, there's a lot of question marks there that really have not been adequately addressed. Um, and then my final point, I think, on on confidence in this is, even if even if we step back and assume that the engineers have the perfect solution, uh, both from a long-term and a short-term solution, which which I do not have that confidence. Uh, but even if we assume that. The reality is, is for any of this to work, we've got to have the policymakers and the funding to pay for this. And I don't think that, that any of us can say that we have the confidence in, a, in our government to put the, uh, the amount of money behind this that it really is going to take to, uh, to address these issues that are in front of us. And that's really one of my biggest uh, concerns with this is, uh, is simply that, that we don't have the, the policies in place and we won't in the future to, to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Jerry Peck, followed by Linda Lewison, and then Beth Kierman. state manufacturing association in the United States. Manufacturers in Illinois employ more than 600,000 workers and contribute the single largest portion of the gross state product. Thank you. Illinois manufacturers were responsible for over 92 billion in economic output last year alone. Illinois residents benefit greatly from an all of the above energy policy. Our state's balanced energy portfolio of coal, nuclear, natural gas, and renewable sources ensure that we have a strong, stable energy supply at relatively low cost. Reliable and affordable energy is a key factor that helps ensure that Illinois manufacturers can remain competitive in a world economy. Nuclear plants account for 48% of electric power generated in Illinois. We encourage you to carefully consider the economic impact of regulations governing the transportation and storage of spent nuclear fuel. Nuclear power plants were never intended to be permanent storage sites for spent fuel. Since 1983, utilities have paid more than $29 billion into the nuclear waste fund, yet no permanent storage site has been opened. As a result, 13% of our nation's spent nuclear fuel remains in temporary storage in Illinois power plants. It's time to open Yucca Mountain or similar long-term storage facilities. Illinois residents and manufacturers greatly benefit from reliable and affordable energy produced by nuclear power plants. Any efforts to cripple the industry through vexatious regulation is dangerous, not only to our state's economy, but to the long-term health and safety of Illinois residents. Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. I'm speaking tonight. Is it on the way? No. I'm speaking tonight. My mic is the Linda Lewison. I'm speaking tonight. Wearing my hat as a core team member of the Sierra Club with the Free Campaign. Um, I want to address my remarks, especially about to speak about Zion, if they are preempted. Forty miles up the road at the Zion Nuclear Power Generation Plant in December, over a thousand tons high-level radioactive waste is going to be transferred into dry cast. As reported by Pat Daly of Zion Solutions in August 2013. In the near future in Fukushima, over 400 tons of high-level radioactive waste are due to be transferred out of human four and into, and into dry, and into dry casks. Zion was operating from 76 to, to 98 to 78. Fukushima was operating from 78 to 2011. What we have here is a situation where we in the Chicago Milwaukee metropolitan area, over 6 million people, are going to be exposed to comparative or greater risk from a larger and dirtier radioactive waste fuel transfer which is projected to take about a year to complete in both places than what is going to happen soon in Fukushima. Although everyone is doing their best at Zion Solutions, a shell company authorized through Exelon, the scale of decommissioning fuel transfers has never, this scale of decommissioning has never been attempted before. We, the people who live within 50 mile radius of Zion, remain deeply concerned because the public oversight and transparency is far from adequate to the enormity and riskiness of the task. Irradiated fuel transfers have never been attempted before on this scale. So where does a generic environmental impact statement figure into a decommissioning process? The situation at Zion and Fukushima changes from moment to moment, not only on the physical level, where we can which we can see, but even more critically, at the molecular and subatomic level. This is a quote from an authority from Canada, Dr. Gordon Edwards. A central fact about radioactivity is that no one knows how to turn it off. Radioactive materials continue to emit atomic radiation at a rate which cannot be influenced by any of the usual factors, heat, pressure, chemical reactions, absorption, dilution, nothing can be used to speed up, slow down, or stop the process of radioactive disintegration from occurring. This central fact means that, quote, radioactive cleanup, unquote, is a very misleading phrase. It suggests to ordinary people that we can somehow get rid of radioactive contamination, but we cannot do so, at least not in any absolute sense. All we can do is move the contamination from one place to another, if you decontaminate one site, you must be contaminating another site. The contamination may be repackaged, consolidated, or managed, or made less available to the environment of living things, but it cannot be eliminated. Governments and their electorates have been misled by the nuclear industry into believing false notions about nuclear waste. Laws have been passed, millions of dollars spent, they do not know how to do this. There is no way to clean up or dispose of radioactive waste. So how can we ever capture one moment in time with something called GEIS and presume that it will capture what is happening in this ever-changing reality? Every reactor site is unique. If they were to drop one cask out at Zion, you could punch a hole in the bottom of the pool. It would partially drain, and in a worst case scenario, set fuel on fire in a few hours of an order of magnitude greater than Chernobyl. These are catastrophic risks, 
and we cannot address them through this absurdity of a generic impact statement. And these are site-specific impacts in this very densely populated area that we need to take into consideration as we make our future plan. In closing, we oppose the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Waste Confidence Draft GIS and ask NRC to withdraw it for thorough revision. We have no confidence in the NRC's lack of a plan in place. As my colleague Shirley Bain from California put it years ago, why would we ever support an energy source that had no plans and knew there was no way to safely dispose of its deadly radioactive waste when it began, hid this from the public, and we are now left with the creation of endless waste, endless economic and environmental cost, and endless risk to ourselves and to the planet. Why would we ever pick such an energy source in the first place? Thank you. This member of the public does not share your confidence. 
You write as if you have access to an omniscient crystal ball providing you access to the state of our planet for a hundred year plus years, when in fact, with the accelerating global warming and increasingly apparent climate change, you have no idea what is to come. We are seeing increasing detrimental superstorms wrecking unimaginable havoc, the level of which has never before occurred. Supposedly, you studied what happened at Fukushima Daiichi, and yet I have seen no, no evidence that you have learned anything from your study. If you had, you would be shutting down all of the nuclear plants in this country to call the future production of toxic nuclear waste and would be devoting your full attention to resolving the problem of current toxic nuclear waste accumulation. I have a lot more to say and I'll submit my written, but I'm going to finish with this paragraph. As stewards of this planet, it is time for the members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to begin to act responsibly and stop all further toxic nuclear waste production. Your job is not to represent the greedy, reckless, and irresponsible nuclear industry. You need to be prepared for a superstorm and how you will handle the consequential impact on nuclear waste storage. Contrary to what you have presented, each plant's situation and environmental impact will be different and all will be catastrophic. Climate change is real. Superstorms are occurring along with earthquakes in regions where they did not previously occur with greater regularity. If you do not begin to make responsible decisions regarding the protection of this planet and its humanity, then you need to remove your NRC motto, protecting people and the environment, because your adequate effort will have failed and all will be harmed as a result. Thank you. If you guys could just hang tight for just a second, we'll try to get this worked out real fast. Hello, hello. This one, if you speak loud enough, is just fine. So if people can hold on to this mic while they're talking and project, I think you should be okay. Can you hear me fine with that? Yes. Test, test one, two. Test one, two. Testing. Testing. <coughs> testing. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. would just please hold the microphone and make sure you talk into it. From up here, you can kind of hear whether you can be heard in the back, and people will give you a thumbs up or thumbs down, I'm sure. So thank you. For our next speakers, let's go ahead and go to Brandon DeGraff, followed by Kevin Camps, and Carol Kurz. And as a reminder, since it's been a few minutes, please introduce yourself when you get into the film. No. No. Hold it. 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 Hold it.
the department, so I have intimate knowledge of you know, the topic we're talking about here today. To give you some background about me, I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Uh, I've been working in the, in, in the industry for about four years now and currently responsible for managing the reload for Quad City Station. So I'm a class of engineers at the Exelon and the nuclear industry time, smart, intelligent, young individuals. So the fundamental question of today's meeting is do we have reasonable assurance that it's safe to store spent fuel beyond the license life of nuclear plant power plants? And to answer this question, the NRC put together the generic environmental uh, statement, which concluded that it is safe to store. And upon reviewing of it and using my engineering background and knowledge from the industry, uh, I agree with their conclusions. The fact of the matter is, even if we never get a repository, uh, spent fuel pools and dry casts are both safe options based on their continued performance. In fact, Illinois has the largest inventory of used spent nuclear fuel and has not had a spent nuclear fuel accident. And that's not short-sightedness, that's proven engineering. Uh, by about, uh, I'm sorry, this is, based, this is because the, both technologies are designed to be robust. Every day we think about what's the worst case scenario. That's what I'm tuned to do. Um, and we design to protect the health and safety of the public. So for example, spent fuel pools are designed with reinforced concrete walls, stainless steel liners, leak detection systems, redundant monitoring, cooling, and makeup water systems. Dry casks, they're designed with leak tight steel cylinders. They're actually welded shut, and they have concrete liners which protect and shield the environment from the radiation. I walk by these things every day. I've worked in the spent fuel pool buildings, and I still get more radiation from flying on an airplane to visit my sister in the south. The casks uh, are also air-cooled, have no moving parts, and are not dependent on any operator or system actuation to be safe. In fact, in Fukushima, there were casks at that facility. They were knocked over, they were wetted, but they were safe, not only any radiation. And the spent fuel pool, as much as some of the media might have said that there was accidents, because the spent fuel pool had uh, lost some water, none of the fuel were made, became actually uncovered if you actually read the reports from the analysis after the accident. <coughs> so, on top of all that, the fuel itself is robust. I mean, we pick materials so that they can handle the harsh environment of the reactor. So it has to be degradation resistant. Um, so, once it becomes spent use, or spent nuclear fuel, that properties don't magically disappear. It's still degradation resistant. So it comes down to this. I mean, as nuclear engineers, the last thing we want to do is cause any harm to the environment. I mean, I have a son, I have a fam family at home, and I care about the environment just as much as you. Um, you know, many of us became nuclear engineers because we know it's a green technology and it's a workable technology today. So I hope one day we can actually do one better and reprocess the fuel and minimize the amount of waste that is produced. But until then, there is reasonable assurance that we can safely store spent fuel and dry cast in pools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I work at Beyond Nuclear as Radioactive Waste Specialist. We're a national watchdog group on the nuclear power industry. I also serve on the board of directors of Don't Waste Michigan, which is a statewide coalition, and I represent the Kalamazoo chapter, which is my hometown. And I was uh, planning to speak about some site-specific issues in this region of the country, specifically the Great Lakes Basin. So as some previous speakers have mentioned, uh, there are four reactors in Illinois, which are Fukushima Daiichi twin designs. These are General Electric Mark I boiling water reactors located in Dresden and Quad Cities. And we've seen on live television what these reactors are capable of in terms of risks if you lose the electric grid and the emergency diesel generators for a long enough period of time. And uh, the pool risks are also highlighted by what's happened at Fukushima Daiichi. As Linda Lewison mentioned earlier, the extraction of the high-level radioactive waste from the Unit 4 pool is about to begin at Fukushima Daiichi Unit Number 4. It's a very dicey operation. The uh, 
Cooling water at one point was salt water, so the fuel is likely corroded. The fuel may be bent, it may be damaged, it could fail during this unloading procedure. There's the largest John Electric Mark I boiling water in the world at Fermi Unit 2 in Monroe, Michigan. And ironically enough, it shares a lot in common with Fukushima Daiichi Unit Number 4. Some 40 years ago, the structural welds were not put in place that can support the crane and the 100 ton waste transfer casks that would be used to remove the fuel. So despite having a permit for dry cast storage for several years now, Fermi Unit 2 still has all of the waste it's ever generated in its high-level radioactive waste storage pool. The dangers include just simply dropping one of these heavy loads through the floor of the pool, as Linda mentioned. The, the scenario of partial drain down is the worst case scenario, where you have no air cooling whatsoever, and you could have a radioactive inferno in just a few hours time, which would dwarf we've seen in Fukushima Daiichi thus far. I wanted to shift with my remaining time to dry cask storage risks in this part of the country. The way I got involved in these issues 20 years ago was at Palisades uh, near Kalamazoo on the Lake Michigan shoreline. Uh, a lot of people, including the Attorney General of Michigan, fought the loading of those dry casks, and for very good reason. They're 100 yards from the water of Lake Michigan, in fact, they're in violation of NRC earthquake safety regulations. This was brought to light in February of 1994 by the NRC Region 3 Dry Cask Storage Inspector, Dr. Ross Lansman, who's now retired. He warned that an earthquake could uh, open up the sand that those casks rest on, and they could find themselves on the bottom of Lake Michigan. And in fact, there's enough fissile material still in the waste that in the presence of water, you could have a chain reaction in so that's a risk going on on the Lake Michigan shoreline right now. Can I get you back? My final point has to do with a whistleblower right here in the Chicago area, uh, Oscar Sharani, who passed away a number of years ago, who called attention to the shortcuts on safety going on with the whole tech cast design. In a short three-day inspection, he, uh, he and a team of experts from across the country identified nine categories of quality assurance <coughs> These are deployed at Dresden, and uh, he questioned the structural integrity of these dry casks sitting still. So for over a decade now, hundreds of environmental groups have called for the pools to be emptied into hardened on-site storage, a major safety upgrade on status quo dry cask storage, fortifications against terrorist attacks, safeguards against accidents. That's what needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Sandy McComb, Doug O'Brien, and then Tom Riley. This is Carol. Hello, everybody. Um, a lot of the comments that I was going to make have been covered at some point, but I will <clears throat> run through them. What I have, hopefully, will be an addition. Um, I'm concerned about the safety of nuclear energy. It does not have a reliable safety history. There have been 26 accidents in the U.S since 1961, some with fatalities. That's one every two years, the most notable being, being a Three Mile Island. Fukushima in 2011 is important because we have four Mark Ones here in Illinois. Radiation is still pouring into the Pacific Ocean as workers frantically try to keep rods covered with water. Now there's talk of robots to remove rods from the reactor without causing a catastrophic fire. This accident wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. And it should be a wake-up call for all of us. In the U.S., <clears throat> spent fuel pools are even more crowded than Japan's. The NRC was to find a permanent leak type... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to break this. What did I do? I 
trying to say is the sped fuel pools are more crowded than Japan's. The understudy was to find a permanent tight in the big loud. The NRC was to, was to find a permanent leak tight site for spent fuel. With Yaka off the map and our nuclear waste growing past 70,000 tons, a federal court ruled in 2012 that the NRC could not proceed with new licenses or extensions until they completed an environmental study to show the environmental and health effects over time if spent fuel was not stored in a repository. The NRC's draft waste confidence GIS skirts the issue of long-time storage safety by assuming fuel in dry casks can be managed indefinitely for hundreds of years. It does not consider the possibility of terror attacks, nor mention the impacts of pool leaks, especially tritium, where there's a significant history of such, ac such accidents, nor show concern for earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, floods which grow stronger with climate change. In addition, the waste problem is further convoluted by NRC's proposal to include in reactor licenses their idea that spent fuel can be stored safely above ground forever, which would end any public discussion about permanent storage and creation of more waste since there is no problem. There's talk of Illinois becoming a centralized interim storage site, although interim seems to be taking on a new meaning of possibly forever. Maps from Oak Ridge National Laboratory put Illinois number one on all but a few maps because of our centralized location. We also have the most reactors and the largest amount of waste. We don't want interim storage here. Fuel should be moved only once on the way to the repository. Interim storage wastes time and money, and we'd be a prime destina <clears throat> destination for terrorists. The cycle of making waste we can't dispose of is insanity. There's already enough waste for one yucca. Now we're working on two. We should follow the lead of the Swedes and the Finns and bury it. Aging nuclear power plant licenses should not be extended nor new ones built until a permanent repository is built. We ask that the NRC withdraw its proposed DGIS until the NRC provides substantial proof and scientific evidence of the safety of their conclusions. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, I do like speaking in microphones. <laughs> the federal courts have said NRC must have a valid and realistic assessment of the environmental impact of long-term storage of spent nuclear fuel. In response, the NRC plans to take only two years for the EIS, or more correctly, the environmental review. NRC's own staff says it will take seven years to do an EIS. The two-year time frame NRC is using has been only enough time to summarize the currently available information about the risks of long-term storage. And the existing information is inadequate. One study is looking at the long-term storage it's been started, but it'll take until 2019 to finish. NRC is currently assuming what will happen in the distant future. Assumptions of the effect of climate change, for example, and some of these we can already see are wrong. For example, the GEIS says a one meter rise in water level won't endanger any plant. And there are in fact three plants that would be impacted by this rise in water level. 
NRC also has not adequately studied the environmental impact of fuel degradation and task deterioration over time. Finally, since the NRC is doing a generic environmental impact study, the site-specific site issues, of which there are several major issues, aren't being addressed. Sounds to me like we're inviting a catastrophe. Is this what we want? Should NRC be licensing and relicensing plants placed based on their grossly inadequate GEIS? The answer is a resounding no. They must not be allowed to just state they are confident the waste will be safely stored without any basis in fact. NRC's response and their GEIS is not any better than their past position of just stating they were confident that waste would be safely stored. I don't feel safe. And following up, we'll go to Tammy Thompson, Amanda Stenson, and Edward Smith. <laughs> My name is Doug O'Brien, I'm the Executive Director of the Illinois Clean Energy Coalition, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak at this hearing today. When it comes to the rhetoric of a lot of the activists who oppose nuclear energy, the story always remains the same. There's some hypothetical scenario or red herring issue concocted to represent the immediate peril supposedly created by nuclear power. But as always, upon closer examination, the story unravels. The storage of spent nuclear fuel has been taking place in Illinois for decades, in fact, for a half a century since the first commercial reactor went online in Illinois. In that time, there has not been a single breach at a spent fuel storage facility. There has not been a single case of public injury or contamination as a result of a spent fuel storage facility failing. There has not been a single instance where any person or group has been able to obtain spent fuel for nefarious purposes. Now, of course, the past is no guarantee of what's to come in the future. These are facts, plain and simple. To try and counter these facts and the overall safety record of nuclear energy with scenarios worthy of the most inventive Hollywood screenwriter is to irresponsibly distract from what should be a serious discussion of the important role of nuclear power in creating a diverse and independent energy supply for our country. These tactics also divert attention from the growing chorus of support for nuclear energy from the environmental movement itself. Among those who realize that if we are going to reduce our carbon footprint in a meaningful way, we must rely on the single greatest source of carbon-free emission, nuclear. There are many examples in recent media about uh, the environmental leaders, about how the global warming's Mount Rushmore leaders in the, in the environmental community wisely embrace nuclear power. And the energy secretary who states that nuclear power will play a key role in the fight against climate change. Now we can juxtapose the hypothetical scenarios that try to paint a spent fuel storage is some impending doom with some very tangible data. According to NASA client Simon, the scientist James Hansen, who is a leading voice in the battle against global warming, the use of nuclear power generation has globally prevented the emission of over 60 billion tons of greenhouse gases and has prevented as many as one million premature deaths globally. This is quantifiable. It's not based on what-ifs, maybes, theoreticals, or scenarios. The Illinois Clean Energy Coalition promotes the use of clean energy sources in a competitive and sustainable marketplace that will fuel our economy while benefiting our environment. The coalition supports the proposed waste confidence rule because the facts show that spent fuel can be and is safely and securely stored in Illinois. 
We further urge the NRC to move forward expeditiously with the construction of a central spent fuel repository, which will help us further develop the potential of nuclear energy and nuclear science across the nation. Thank you. that is as 
open to other uh, businesses talking to each other about their problems than the nuclear industry. We have forums set up across the country to discuss each other with whatever problems we might be having to kind of gain insight um, to how to solve those, and that's unheard of in any other industry. That's why I have confidence. We're not afraid to say that we made a mistake and we need to fix it. Um, another thing about safety is that Braidwood is rated a VPP star safety site, and that's not something that corporate pays for, that's something that comes from the people that work there. A lot of people um, have jobs in other manufacturing industries. You may have to wear a hard hat, you may have to wear safety glasses, you may have to wear steel toe shoes. Those are just requirements to work in our plants. And it, does, it goes beyond just those things too. It goes to the level of checking components um, to a degree that you never would have thought that we actually do. So that's another reason why I have confidence in our station safety. <coughs> Um, the first week that I started at Braidwood, uh, I started in radiation protection, as I mentioned before. The first class that they put me in was on dry gas storage. And it wasn't because I was on the team, it was because I worked in the power plant and they wanted me to understand what they were going to be doing on site. And that's the kind of level of effort that the, uh, our company, Excellent, puts on its employees. They want us to understand what's going on and how to um, explain to other people. I give a lot of tours. and. Um, you know, coming and watching the students come in and talk to them about the safety of the plant um, and just really answering any questions that they have. I've also talked to um, college students as well about this as well. And that's why I have confidence. Um, I thank you, the NRC, to, for having this meeting and I urge you to finalize the Waste Confidence Draft Rule in a thorough yet timely manner to help uh, our company work to its best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Dunlap, Jan Dudart, and Christine Gregory. Hello, everybody. My name is Ed Smith. I work for the Missouri Coalition for the Environment in St. Louis, Missouri, the Safe Energy Director. Uh, St. Louis purified the uranium from the Belgian Congo that went into the first self sustaining nuclear chain reaction at the U of Chicago. Uh, we have some of the oldest radioactive waste on the planet, and it doesn't take a nuclear accident to have to worry about cleaning it up. We're still dealing with it. So, regardless of a hypothetical accident, release of radioactivity into the environment is a significant challenge that takes decades to address. One problem we have, just so everybody knows, is some of this radioactive material, a significant amount of thorium-230, made it into a landfill in the Missouri River on line, which is currently experiencing a subsurface landfill fire a thousand feet away from the radioactive wastes. And we're bickering with the EPA and other government agencies on exactly how to disposition these radioactive wastes. There's actually people that want to leave it there. We can't find a proper solution to deal with this so-called low-level ionizing radiation in the landfill. What the heck are we going to do with the stuff that's sitting in the spent fuel pools, like the 2,363 fuel assemblies at the Callaway One nuclear reactor that my organization is legally challenging for license extension of? But when we went to go challenge the license extension, we faced challenges, including uh, challenges to the spent nuclear fuel pool. We'd, only, we'd have to prove that there were site-specific degradation to the fuel pool, is my understanding. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, we couldn't comment or challenge the future integrity of that unless we've experienced issues. So if the NRC incorporates the draft's GEIS into every reactor license, the conclusion that spent fuel, the, excuse me, the conclusion is that spent fuel can be a safe, the, with the conclusion that spent fuel can be safely stored above ground and definitely will forbid future analysis of spent fuel in reactor licensing actions like ours, silencing the concerns of growing populations around nuclear reactors. The draft GEIS reinstitutes a uh, kick the can down the road approach that has failed to address the magnitude of our nuclear waste problem and legacy. <clears throat> Assuming that institutional controls will work is absurd. Like this landfill that I mentioned, the Environmental Protection Agency doesn't know where a pile of radioactive dirt went. 
says so in its documents, it's ridiculous to think that institutional controls will work for, for centuries, let alone a couple of decades. Putting the GIS into effect after the operating life of a nuclear reactor is a sham and in no way a proper approach to spent fuel management. I say this because reactors were licensed to operate for 40 years and then they were meant to retire. The NRC has allowed reactors to operate up to 60 years and possibly 80. That means it'll be 140 years or longer before we figure out where that stuff's going. Uh, it, it's important to get this right because the nuclear industry wants thousands of small modular reactors around the world, which means at least hundreds, if they get their way, around the country. And these will be the operate, this will be the guidance for hundreds of small modular reactors. It's important that they get it right, which is why they should be withdrawing this current plan and going back to the drawing board. Underestimating the risk puts taxpayers, as we some other folks said, at significant risk due to the liability factor. It doesn't, just because we haven't had one doesn't mean one can't happen. There's tons of unknown unknowns out there, and one accident will cap the liability at $21 billion, I believe it is, and with uh, Congress, yeah, and well, with Congress not even being able to allocate funding to Sandy, how are we going to expect them to fund a nuclear disaster? Thanks. continue progress on a permanent solution for the storage of spent fuel. Uh, Exelon supports the development of the GEIS as a stepping stone in this process and supports and agrees with the conclusions of this report. The draft report is a rigorous examination of the environmental impact based on 50 years of research and operating experience. The report draws on industry, government, and academic references to compile a complete review of the potential impacts of spent fuel storage. The report appropriately looks at bounding conditions over the time periods in question, and the conclusion forms a sound basis for continued nuclear fuel storage and disposal. As a generic report, we understand the use of bounding assumptions. Uh, these types of assumptions reserve, result in a conservative product that is used on a generic basis, but also may not be fully representative of what will occur at a site with fuel storage. For instance, the report assumes that a dry transfer facility will be built at all dry cast storage facilities, and that all dry casts will be replaced every 100 years. While the conditions of the cast will, of course, be closely monitored over the lifetime of the facility, and a rigorous aging management program is already in place, it is unlikely that wholesale replacement of all casts will be required, and the transfer facility may not be needed for all sites. Furthermore, NRC is correct in concluding that it is feasible to have a mine geological repository available in 60 years after the licensed operating life of a nuclear power plant, as assumed in the analysis of, short, of a short-term impact in the GEIS. There should be no technical obstacles to achieving this, nor are there any financial obstacles, given that the Nuclear Waste Fund now has a balance of more than $26 billion. Despite recent delays in the process due to political and legal maneuvers, progress is being made in establishing a permanent repository. The NRC is resuming the licensing proceedings for the Yucca Mountain application, which will further inform efforts in developing a geological repository. Legislation is pending in the Senate to begin the process of selecting alternate sites using a consent-based approach consistent with the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission. This progress supports the conclusion we have the technology to develop a geological repository for spent nuclear fuel, and we have the money to do so. The only thing blocking the United States from building a geological repository is political decision making. In the interim, for storage at the reactor, as I have said, we continue to safely store fuel in both wet and dry storage. And just to add a little perspective, 
the amount of storage required is very small. If we stacked all the stored fuel in Illinois up to the height of an average person, it would only fill up half of one football field. The NRC environmental assessment of nuclear fuel storage accurately reflects that environmental impacts are small for both continued storage at plant sites and away from reactor storage, even with many bounding assumptions that may overstate the impact. This conclusion is based on storage systems for nuclear fuel that are a proven technology with robust design and safety features that prevent environmental impacts. The analysis contained in that draft in the draft waste confidence generic environmental impact statement supports what the industry has long known. If necessary, used fuel can be stored in a safe, environmentally sound manner for a long period while we wait for the political process to reach agreement on a disposal solution. In the meantime, the NRC can and should issue its waste confidence rule. Thank you for the opportunity to come. And after Jan, let's go to Vincent Heddington and Susan Korn. question about uh, the fact that there has been um, some anecdotal um, testimony here about the effects of living near nuclear power plants and the people who come to represent the industry have nothing to say about the anecdotal evidence. Um, the stories about what happens to families and children who are living near these plants um, and the um, possibility of uh, birth defects that are almost unbelievable. So I, I'm asking this question because there was an earlier comment about this. Residents around reactor sites may not have signed up to store radioactive waste indefinitely. But they also did not sign up for 20-year extensions of operating licenses. Yet the NRC imposes that on communities without cause and without exception. So um, I'm very moved by the anecdotal evidence because uh, the anecdotal evidence from Chernobyl was cut off. And uh, the difficulties of Tracing the effects of the explosion at Chern Chernobyl were massive, and eventually the um, strong scientific mind says, well, gee, you're just giving us anecdotal evidence, when it was evidence, when it was all the evidence that they had. Um, and I have a question. Why can't insurance companies insure these sites? If the nuclear power plants are so safe, then there should be a way for, an, for insurance companies to insure them. But that doesn't happen because, um, would you tell me? Uh, does it say two? One minute. One minute. Okay. But that doesn't happen because the consequences of accidents at nuclear power plants run in the billions. I thought it was very interesting that the last speaker said, well, we've got $26 billion to uh, take care of nuclear waste. Um, I believe that the cost of Chernobyl has exceeded a trillion at this point, and nobody has, nobody ever mentions the first responders there or at Ch Chernobyl that are now all dead, and um, the effects of the whole nuclear project, the, the effect that the whole nuclear power project is having in the world. Um, we're very, very much against having Iran develop nuclear power of their own because we know that the byproduct of a nuclear reactor is plutonium that is used in atomic bombs. And this is the most dangerous element or I, it's the most dangerous isotope in the world. And it had to be gone from the earth before the biosphere could develop 
now the biosphere has developed and we're bringing the plutonium back to our enormous risk. I'm Vince Henning, citizen, a resident of Burr Ridge. And can you believe it? Can you really believe it? Sometimes listening to the comments here tonight of the proponents of nuclear power, I think they're from another planet. Can you believe that we are supposed to believe that nuclear power plants can continue producing waste without an adequate plan, an adequate plan for its disposal. This toxic radioactive waste, we're supposed to go along on this gamble, on this grand experiment that an industry can produce waste in a way when it doesn't know how it's going to handle it. In the meantime, we are exposed to the possibility of a nuclear accident. Nobody here in this room can say with assurance that there will not be an accident. We have the evidence of Fukushima. I listen to the proponents. They downplay the effects of Fukushima. They downplay the accidents that have happened and we're supposed to be bear that kind of a risk. I refuse to bear that kind of a risk. What needs to happen, we need to stop producing the waste, we need to stop licensing nuclear power plants and their relicensing, we need to stop this insanity. for the construction of the spent fuel storage infrastructure at our sites. First and foremost, I just want to say that I am extremely proud to be an Exelon nuclear employee. I have a degree in nuclear engineering and I've worked in the industry for 25 years. And a side note, I have had three children. I have been pregnant through um, working at the plants. I have three healthy um, young adult women. So I'm a testimony that um, working in a plant, being pregnant, has no impact on very healthy children. That you know. <laughs> um, that was a side note that was not in my notes. Um, what I really want to tell you is I have worked for a long time in the industry and I can tell you the folks that I work with throughout the organization from top to bottom have an appreciation that nuclear power is special. We get that. We understand it's special. And it's our priority every day in what we do to ensure that we operate these plants in a manner that protects the health and safety of the public. We do live in the vicinity of plants. We have family, we have friends, we have our colleagues, we care about them deeply. We would not put any of those people in harm's way. Excellent employees are committed to ensuring that our plants run safely. Our plants operate 93% of the time, regardless of the weather or the time of day, providing a reliable base load output greater than any other generation source. We understand that the decisions we make on a daily basis have the potential to impact the lives of our coworkers, our family, and the surrounding communities. Because of this, we hold each other accountable. We challenge, we train, and we continuously improve. If you spent a day with us in our facilities, you, it would be apparent to you. We take nothing for granted. We get independent expert opinions on technical issues. You would see that our employees are encouraged to and are comfortable with challenging each other. You would hear every morning across our organization industry experience being shared and actions taken to ensure that we mitigate potential issues. We take our jobs seriously, and this extends to the design, building, maintenance, and security of our spent fuel storage system. Our dry cast storage containers, they're rugged. They're steel lined with thick concrete and closed structures. They are designed and proven to protect the fuel under the most extreme weather conditions or other destructive forces. 
I personally have no doubt that this passive cooling technology offers a long-term solution that will protect my colleagues, my family, and my neighbors. And I fully support the rolling. Thank you. My name is Corey Kahn. I'm a resident of Chicago for the last 17 years. And, uh, we know a lot of defective casks arrived uh, from Voltec. That resident were loaded after uh, some welding was done without a post-weld heat treat in violation of uh, 10 CFR 50 Appendix B. <clears throat> a lot of problems with those casks that lead to uh, reasonable expectation that they do not have the strength that their original designs had. I'm sure you're proud to work there, but you know that's a rather dirty operation. Um, years ago, I read a phrase that startled me, and I mentioned it to a friend who was also actively concerned about nuclear waste on reactors, which make it. I was equally startled by my friend's reaction, which was, don't even say that. That phrase was, nuclear waste tends to remain where it is first place. Now, a dozen years later, I'm hearing exactly this from NRC. As my friend may have unforeseen, it is being offered as a foundation for licensing decisions, and don't say that it is not. In 1984, when the original waste confidence decision was published, the NRC believed and assured us that the repository would be available just 24 or 25 years into the future. Soon, the belief receded to a repository available 41 years after the waste confidence decision was first articulated. Now the NRC assures us that a suitable repository will be available when necessary. A term which I interpret to mean repository availability prior to on-site storage failure. That's just in time. JIT, just in time inventory management. I've always understood that term to be a euphemism for almost too late. <coughs> and a, an available repository is actually of little value if thousands of tons of freshly irradiated fuel remains precariously perched in the elevated pools. It matters not that waste may also be stored nearby in dry casks, as every operating reactor must also have its pool. This conclusion uh, in the updated uh, decision is unanchored in reality. When necessary, it's a science fiction and fantasy. The Commission hasn't performed a thorough and comprehensive analysis of the future dangers and consequences on the site. Uh, of on-site storage 60 years after the cessation and offers only a retrospective that's rosy. Yet we all know that past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. So cool, drain down, boil off, and zirconium uh, fire comprise the natural end state toward which nuclear affairs are naturally drawn by a great attractor, the natural course of things. Only through the ongoing interventions of dutiful employees has it been forestalled. Like jugglers, operators have been attended to every glitch, catching every ball before it reaches the ground. Where in NRC's thorough and comprehensive but unperformed analysis of the future should we expect to find such dutiful employees? Six, to eight, uh, six decades after the nuclear steam supply business has gone bust. I'll just make a casual reference to Michael Byrne and the convicted uh, mass gunman carjacking uh, senior operator with the six years of unsquirted access at present with his cast. Um, it's a faith-based waste policy. <laughs> uh, licensing, relicensing, and taking uh, actions taken under this dogmatic rubric leave us perpetually rudderless and drifting on an overfilled pool. Um, very good. The, uh, is it true that the hazards and insecurity of pool storage are so grave that they must be withheld from us as classified safeguards information? or official use only security? Could anyone possibly believe that the redacted material supports NRC's finding of no significant impact? We require a much larger margin of safety between us and the American spent fuel <coughs> pool fire if we require far better decisions about plutonium. NRC should perform court-ordered analysis. <laughs> Um, 
My name is Dale Lehman. I'm a citizen of Chicago. I appreciate the chance to speak to the NRC's, or in the NRC's confidence game. The fact is that this kind of meeting and the conversations pro and con took place in Japan not so long ago, where the technicians and the proponents of nuclear power assured the public that they were uninformed, that things operated carefully, well-designed, highest technology, security, no previous accidents. All that is uh, gone now. Japan itself almost became a failed state. It remains to be seen whether they can sustain themselves. Tokyo was heavily irradiated in the accident. Japanese government lied about that because of business interests. The Japanese government elevated the standards of radiation allowable for children to address the severity of the contamination rather than evacuating them because the main concern was money. A healthy business of climate, which we've heard addressed earlier, is not necessarily a healthy future for mankind. Business operates generally in our current state at the expense of the public's health and the future of the planet. A lot of people think that this is hyperbolic, yet we cannot act to deal with climate change in a meaningful way. The NRC has no ability to assure me with confidence that a super storm, a super tornado, pass over any of the proposed future storage sites indefinitely. Can you guarantee me that uh, 200 mile an hour winds will leave those fuel pools unaffected? Will you force the operators of those plants to upgrade to a level to ensure that? I don't think so, because they don't want to spend the money necessary to make an unsafe technology theoretically safe. There's a question of whether we're going to survive as a society, just like Japan, in the event of uh, regional superstorms coming from increasing disturbances in the Arctic. Arctic News, a real-time website of observations, documents, what's happening there now and how it's affecting Northern Hemispheric weather, especially over the mid-continent. We cannot be assured that a major extreme freak storm will not pass over a nuclear power plant and drain a fuel pool of its water. What happens then to your promises about safety to your families, and to the regions which will be exposed to the same kind of radiation that spewed from Fukushima. I think you should think twice about whether the food you put on your table because of the industry you work for is worth the future that you threaten, or that the industry, I, I mean no disrespect for people who work for the nuclear industry. It's not a personal issue. It's a systemic issue, and the fact that this country has been overwhelmed by corporations and business whose first concern is profit over safety. Thank you.
rural discussions are often discouraged, especially their jobs. I'd like to give some insights on why I'm supportive of rural. I spent some time in my career working at the nuclear station, and I have first-hand experience with such fuel storage. I personally walked down the dry gas storage area and worked next to a loaded dry cask, and I have spent considerable time working near spent fuel pools. Storing fuel in either the spent fuel pool or in the dry cask storage is equally safe. First, I'd like to discuss the spent fuel pool. The spent fuel pool is where the spent fuel is stored until it's ready to be placed in the dry cask storage. I have spent many hours working near the spent fuel pools, observing the fuel and the actions of moving fuel. This is a safe location. This is designed to withstand severe natural accidents, including floods, tornadoes, and earthquakes. The safety of the spent fuel pool is ensured by maintaining sufficient water level above the fuel, even during accident conditions. This pool is designed to be about 40 feet deep and to maintain about 20 feet of water above the fuel in an accident condition. Everyone involved with the spent fuel pool recognizes the importance of the spent fuel pool, and as an employee, I can tell you, we consider safety in every decision that we make. Next, I would like to discuss dry cast storage. Dry cast storage is proven safe technology that is designed for long-term isolation of spent nuclear fuel. The casts themselves are robust concrete and steel structures with no moving parts. These casts are engineered to monitor and protect 10 tons of spent fuel per cask. Over the last 30 years, the nuclear industry has loaded over 1,700 dry cask storage systems. All these systems are still in service and have had zero release of their radioactive contents. I personally have worked near dry casks, and I feel confident in their design and safety. Throughout my career, I have learned that Exxon Nuclear values the health and safety of the public above all else. Safety is infused in everything that we do. I would like to end on a more personal note. I have been an Illinois resident my entire life. Everyone I know and love, including all of my family and my friends, live here in the Chicagoland area. My husband and I live near these plants, and this is where we plan to raise our families. If this technology was not safe, I would not be here. That is all. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Um, my name is Douglas Hoare. I'm a resident of Zion, Illinois. As no, mentioned earlier, I'm a resident of Zion, Illinois. As mentioned earlier, the Zion nuclear plant is currently being decommissioned, and actually, fuel transfer should be starting at any time. So Zion is going to have 65 casts of high-level waste sitting there for, you know, I'm told now, at least a minimum of 35 years. That's if they can open a storage facility now. Uh, it'll be 35 years from now for uh, that fuel to be moved on Zion. So that's the best case scenario. Uh, it just, to me, makes no sense to continue producing more waste when we don't have storage facilities. So I don't think there should be any new licenses or license renewals until a permanent repository is established. This GEIS has one scenario where there's no repository at all becoming available. Again, why would we generate more waste when we're not going to have any storage facility as one possibility? And changing out these casts every hundred years, I mean, a thousand years from now, what kind of shape is it, are these casts going to be in if we have to change them out you know, every hundred years? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Russell. Uh, I'm a construction engineer uh, from Iowa State. I work at the Braidwoods, uh, Braidwood Station Nuclear Power Plant uh, down south of us in Illinois. Uh, the comments that I want to bring forth here are just based on my experience with the safety culture at nuclear power. Um, I know a lot of the criticism we've had is, has been based on um, some, put it pointedly, uh, the lack of morale or morality of some of the people in the nuclear industry. And I just really don't think that's true. Um, again, a lot of folks sitting here can call us young and naive, but I do represent part of the uh, young generation in nuclear, actually, NAYGN, that's exactly what it means, the uh, North American 
young generation nuclear, and really my perspective is uh, just a, a shocking safety culture, um, especially considering what industry I was planning on going into, which was the construction industry. Um, I understand that not all cultures are born from the events of the past, uh, but again, I'd like to talk about the uh, recent performance uh, based on my experience of the nuclear industry. Um, and I believe that it's safe to say that uh, thinking that workers who value their own personal safety uh, is really indicative of workers who also value uh, safety culture in, in a bigger perspective of you know, the effect that it not only has on themselves while they're working, but the uh, public uh, when they leave when they leave that work environment. So something I haven't heard a lot of um, is to throw out some actual facts and statistics. So I'll try and do a little bit of, of that right now. Um, so earlier this year, I gave a speech to some high school uh, kids who were looking at going into the trades. And one of the things I tried to advertise to them when they were looking at what, uh, what trades they wanted to pursue was to look at the nuclear industry. Because really, uh, what they want to do is ensure their longevity. And uh, in order to do that, you want to work in a safe environment. So just pulling straight from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, looking at injuries per uh, 100 full-time uh, workers. Uh, the nuclear industry, is, it's actually pretty shocking how much better we are as far as uh, just the personnel safety. Um, per 100 full-time workers, we get uh, 0.3 <coughs> injuries. Uh, to compare that to other, other generation, uh, really the only next closest generation activity you can compare that to is fossil fuel, and that's, that's 2.1 uh, injuries per 100 full-time workers, so uh, several times higher. Uh, the industry that I thought I was going to go into, construction, uh, 3.7, so even higher, and stepping up to uh, another industry, which is you know an industrial sector of manufacturing, at uh, 4.3 injuries per 100 full-time workers. So I really don't think anybody that uh, I really think that people who value their own personal safety, it's just a cultural um, norm that they're going to also value safety of the public. So one, one thing I did want to respond to that I saw, that I heard uh, mentioned a couple times with response to criticisms of casks falling through the bottom of the spent fuel pool, um, that's a great challenge. So the question is, why the heck would we lift these heavy structures over our spent fuel pool? And, and the answer is we don't. They're designed so that we don't lift heavy structures near these safety critical systems. And I've actually been yelled at several times uh, when developing plans because we have to keep these anything over 2,000 pounds, you know, a set distance away from safety critical things such as a spent fuel pool. So again, get educated and find some facts before you jump up here. Try and do my job. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker. Gail Snyder and Tracy Fox. so I've been concerned about nuclear issues for many years. Um, briefly, um, I'll respond uh, very specifically to uh, the issues tonight. Um, it's not that I'm in favor of these things, but I'm, I'm supporting the least worst alternatives. The first one is to implement dry spent fuel storage in hardened on-site casks, which was mentioned earlier. Immediate efforts should be made to transfer spent fuel sufficiently cooled from wet pool storage to on-site at reactor dry storage in so-called hardened casks. This approach would avoid the need to build additional away from reactor interim spent fuel installations. And as, re and as recommended by Dr. Arjun Makajani, the federal government should purchase land 
adjacent to reactor sites to accommodate this process. Currently, the federal government is paying very large fines to utilities because of its failure to accept spent fuel for long-term storage by 1988. In other words, because um, Yucca Mountain wasn't finished, um, the, the federal government is on the, uh, um, they, they have to pay fines. Once spent fuel comes under federal control, the government no longer would be required to pay these fines. Second thing is limit spent fuel transportation. On-site storage also would save unnecessary transportation costs and reduce radiation exposure risk to the general population during highway, railroad, and barge transit. These risks could be significant because even undamaged transport casks do not have enough shielding to prevent gamma and x-ray radiation from escaping through the walls. Um, thus, I'll skip some of it. If you're sitting in a car next to it, you could be exposed, basically. Uh, the third thing is reduce Illinois' chances of becoming the nation's dump. Illinois already is home to over 9,000 metric tons of used nuclear fuel, more than in any other state. The previous two alternatives would work to minimize Illinois' chances of receiving an even greater proportion of the nation's spent fuel. According to an Oak Ridge National Laboratory report, as a totally separate analysis, this is in quotes, the consolidated um, ISFI uh, independent storage site in Illinois is the single optimized site for an uh, independent spent fuel uh, installation. When, uh, when only SNF at Orphan Reactors is considered relative to siting consolidated. In other words, that's a lot of um, text speak in that particular paragraph, but what it's saying is that Illinois is in a, in a position to become uh, the site of one of these um, independent spent fuel storage facilities. And of course we have the nuclear plant, or the uh, nuclear spent fuel facility at Morris, Illinois. Um, locate, okay, we should locate a geological spent fuel storage repository based on rigid scientific criteria. Maximum effort should be made to thoroughly investigate the least damaging location for a permanent repository, and preferably one that allows for retrievable storage. Can we get you um, to make a wrap up for us? I'm sorry, what? We need you to get you to write wrap up. Okay. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission proposed heavy reliance on a consent-based approach, but that reliance may not lead to the safest long-term solution. While local consent is important, that consent should be based on scientific knowledge rather than, than, rather than on improperly perceived opportunities to obtain money, jobs, and other uh, items. Um, in a nutshell, I'll finish up. No, uh, the waste confidence proposed rule here tonight lacks any sufficient, sufficiently thorough scientific analysis of many options especially concerning spent fuel pool and casks, fires, leaks, and waste storage. How can long-term, let alone indefinite waste storage, even be considered credible? How disintegrated will spent fuel rods be, particularly those with high burnout fuel, when the need for transfer to new casks arises every 100 years or so? One last sentence. What assurance exists that institutional controls will be in place 240,000 years or more in the future uh, that's uh, one of the half-lives of plutonium is 24,000 years, okay. um, to oversee continued safe storage. Nuclear power needs to be phased out. Thank you. Thank you. encircled by nuclear facilities in Illinois, all the way to Michigan. The residents of Illinois did not agree to become the nation's nuclear waste dump. But slowly and ever so quietly over time, the residents of Illinois have, become, um, have come to live with the largest amount of high-level radioactive nuclear energy waste of any state in the country. If the NRC's draft generic environmental impact statement and rule are adopted, all nuclear facilities will officially become permanent nuclear waste dumps. Discovering that no real individual environmental impact study has been done as to how 30 plus years of nuclear waste will impact an area makes the current situation even more unacceptable. Even more shocking is the government and the nuclear industry's current plan 
To plan that the waste may end up staying on site forever, the courts realized that NRCs, and I would add DOE's, unrealistic handling of the nation's nuclear energy waste, and are forcing them to face reality, which unfortunately is not accomplished in the NRC's draft GDEIS rule and rule. In the movie Pandora's Promise, what I believe to be the most important statement in the movie is made by pro-nuclear Mark Linus. While touring the nuclear disaster area in Fukushima, Japan, he says, this was not supposed to happen to a reactor. All the things that are not supposed to happen are exactly the problems with storing nuclear waste. In fact, this is something the nuclear industry operators, investors, governments, and their agencies that facilitate nuclear energy, as well as companies that build nuclear reactors, are concerned about. They know things that aren't supposed to happen do happen. They also know this risk creates great liability. So just like stockpiling the, the nuclear energy waste so quietly, stockpiling risk and liability has happened equally as quietly and has put upon the public, unbeknownst to them, a burden. The public is carrying a portion of the liability and risk for the nuclear industry. This is happening on a global scale. Last week, the U.S. Department of Energy Secretary Munoz went to Japan to offer help to Fukushima as long as Japan signs on to the Convention of Supplementary Compensation for Nuclear Damage, removing the liability for nuclear construction companies and other nuclear vendors from nuclear accidents. If you think the same will not apply here in the U.S., think again. As all those involved in facilitating nuclear power seek to extend the time the nuclear waste stays in our communities, they also seek to reduce their own liability and responsibility to worse yet, as they seek to silence us by including this generic environmental impact statement into the reactor licensing, effectively preventing the public from raising concerns and being able to request the storage um, or question the storage of nuclear waste forever on site at individual nuclear reactor facilities in their own communities. Thank you. Next we'll go to Tammy Fox, followed by Rob McCollum, Kathleen Rood, and Samantha Schulzisi. I apologize if I mispronounced that. My name is Tracy Fox. I work as a volunteer with Peoria Families Against Toxic Waste. We normally work with hazardous waste, uh, heavy metals, and PCBs, and uh, other things that stick around for a long time, but boy, all of that pales in comparison with nuclear. When I reviewed the uh, draft EIS, the first thing that I was taken aback by was the fact that it was a generic EIS, and that some court had authorized that we could have one EIS that would cover what really is a relatively small number of nuclear plants, a discrete hundred or so. Um, and so I thought, all right, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt and I'll open up the big document and start to page through it. And I expected to see tables and charts that might tell me, here's uh, where we're at as far as filling up these plant fuel pools, here's where we're using dry casts, and here's some guidelines for best practices. And I didn't find any of that. I found that kind of quirky. Um, and then I thought, well, we're going to have certainly some best practices and some guidelines that are going to underlie these assumptions. Um, but I didn't find any of that. I had been to some uh, information sessions by NEIS, and I learned about hardened on-site storage, and I expected that, that would get a thorough vetting in the document, but again, I didn't find any of that. Um, instead, I just got some things that are echoed in the executive summary tonight, um, categorizing everything as small risks, small risks, small risks. And I've done quite a bit of technical writing um, in my life, and I was a little bit concerned as to how is that risk laid out and um, how are they analyzing it. And I didn't really find any metrics that gave me too much confidence. I didn't see that they had looked beyond just saying, hmm, infinitesimal possibility of this happening, therefore we should dismiss it. To me, when we're looking at risk, we need to look at what's the probability that it's going to occur, how severe will it be if it occurs, and how likely is it that we can detect it early and put a stop to it. But I didn't see any of that kind of analysis done at all. And that's the kind of analysis that should underlie engineering. And it was painfully absent. I'm also interested in the issue of climate change. And I looked a little bit more detail as to what they did in that section. And I saw that they had forecast a temperature range of about 5.5 degrees Celsius. And they were considering inputs <laughs> all up to that. 
So I expected to see, okay, I've read the book Six Degrees. I know that when you get up to six degrees, it gets pretty horrific. But I didn't see any analysis of water usage. I didn't see anything about increasing water temperatures and how those would affect cooling. I didn't see anything about the push between climate change and water availability. Again, all of that seemed to undermine the fact that I don't believe there was any scientific basis whatsoever for the risk analysis in this document. And to me, in order to have any kind of waste confidence, confidence in any kind of a solution, you have to have an underlying risk management system that makes sense. This doesn't seem to have a system at all. Instead, I think they want to conflate waste confidence with, as my husband terms it, waste arrogance. And that's really all this is. The belief that we can just say, whoosh, we've got a solution, we will continue doing as we are, and it'll work great, and everyone will be happy. Instead, I think about the very real engineering nitpicky details, things like fatigue, stresses on uh, metals that begin to fail, the impacts of corrosion. When things are designed for a 30-year life or even a 60-year life, they do not last for 100 years. Otherwise, then they're over-designed, and that doesn't serve shareholders, so it never, ever happens. Um, I believe that we are making a lot of choices here that are not only endangering us, but also putting off choice, better choices that we could be making. For every dollar that the taxpayer has to sink into nuclear power and dealing with its waste and dealing with its risks is a dollar that we can't be spending on renewables and things that will really move us forward. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Rood, and I'm here speaking on behalf of my nieces and nephews and for the future generations of all walks of life. As I was thinking about what I wanted to say here in response to, um, to this hearing tonight, um, I came, I was reminded of the story of the emperor's new clothes. It's a story of a vain emperor who cares about nothing except wearing and displaying clothes hired he hires two swindlers who promise him the finest, best clothes with a fabric invisible to anyone who is unfit for his position or hopelessly stupid. The emperor's ministers cannot see the clothing themselves, but they pretend that they can for fear of appearing unfit for their positions. And the emperor does the same. Finally, the swindlers report that the suit is finished and they mind dressing the emperor. He marches in procession before his subjects. And the townsfolk play along with the pretense, not wanting to appear unfit for their positions or stupid. But then there's a child in the crowd, and he's too young to understand the desirability of keeping up this pretense. And he blurts out that the emperor is wearing nothing at all. And he frees everyone else in the crowd to start realizing that the emperor is naked. This is a fable that is an apt description of the nuclear industry and of the issue before us tonight is the feasibility of safely storing nuclear waste. The nuclear industry has dressed its operation in the sham of safety, claiming that nuclear power is safe and spent fuel rods can be contained so posing no threat to life on the planet. But that simply isn't true. The emperor has no clothes. Nuclear power plants produce the most deadly waste imaginable. We have already created enough radioactive waste to destroy life on Earth. And the hard truth is, we don't know what to do about it. Fukushima is not hypothetical. It is not theoretical. It is not science fiction or a make-up story. It's real. And it is proof of the fallibility of nuclear power and protection of spent fuel rods. The experts don't know how to keep us safe from it. And yet the NRC and the nuclear industry is acting as if we do. We're looking at the naked emperor and praising his imaginary outfit. Why? I believe it's because when we look at the truth, the real truth of what we've created, we are terrified. Terrified of the magnitude of deadly radioactive waste we've created and are continuing to create. We are terrified of the certainty of contamination. It's already happening. And the destruction of life. The USGS is already finding polar bears and seals with skin rashes and diseases and open sores. Our fish are contaminated with nuclear radiation from Fukushima. 
And so we need to face this fear and embrace it. Because then we can take off the blinders that are keeping us in denial of the truth. We need to pay attention to the boy in this, in this fable. He speaks the truth we are afraid to see. The emperor has no clothes. We do not know how to protect ourselves from radioactive waste. We need to stop making it now. Germany has already done this two years ago. And they are now exporting energy generated from solar power and other sources. So we need to stop pretending that this is safe and that we know what we're doing. And only when we embrace this difficult truth can we really start to have an honest discussion that will find some solutions. The emperor has no clothes. Safely, and I believe that's only going to get better. 
Illinois has loaded 120 casks, safely stored in the pools for 50 years, including the only independent spent fuel storage installation that is a pool in the GE Morris facility, which was recently relicensed. A very tough, highly scrupulous process, like all NRC processes, and this is an example. Illinois leads uh, the nation, and if it weren't for France, would lead the world in reaping the benefits of all of this uh, experience. 50% of your electricity, 5,000 jobs, $400 million in annual payroll, and $117 million in taxes. Most importantly, though, the um, nitrogen oxide pollution that's been avoided by using all this nuclear energy is the equivalent of 4.3 million cars. A lot has been said here tonight, a lot of it's speculative, a lot of it flat out not true. But 4.3 million tons of nitrogen oxide in the air, we know what that does. Very real health effects are attributable to air pollution. I want to talk about two things specifically that we've mentioned a lot tonight. Safety, culture, and climate change. I see these things as becoming intertwined. Safety culture is not about rhetoric, it's not about anecdotes, it's not about speculation. It's about facts. It's about analysis. It's about questioning the facts and doing more analysis. This is what nuclear engineers do. This is why these young people who've gotten up here are so confident. This is why we've achieved the safety record we have. A lot of young people today are looking at the facts about climate change. They're asking the hard questions. They're deciding to become nuclear engineers. If we were to turn our backs on nuclear energy, is the best weapon we have against climate change. Yes, solar should play a role. Yes, wind should play a role. But only nuclear can give you carbon-free, baseload, large-scale electricity generation. If we were to turn our backs on our biggest weapon against climate change, I would question the safety culture of our nation. But I know we won't do that. I, I'm heartened to see how, when I come back to Illinois, so many young people getting into this business and, and, and letting their safety culture drive uh, them and our nation in the right direction. Now, I could get up here and tell you how Greenwell Island didn't hurt anybody, how I don't think Chernobyl but, or even Fukushima could happen in this country, but I won't do that because safety culture, my safety culture won't let me. Safety culture learns. For all we've achieved, for all the record of safety, I believe it's going to get better. I believe the young people are going to do better. It's $26 billion in the nuclear waste fund. The courts that have asked NRC to do this have also asked NRC to restart the Yucca Mountain licensing process. And they're also looking at what the Department of Energy is doing with that money. Our government works. And I really am gratified, not by just hearing my friends and supporters out here, but all the commentary, all the discussion. This is our process at work. This is us asking questions. I'm confident NRC will come up with the answers. I look forward to the final EIS. I support this process. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And after Tina, we'll go to Sherry Katz. I, Tina Seastrom, am here representing myself and the Ellen Cordell, both of Nuclear Energy Information Service. We know that you represent the industry and not the consumer or the people of the earth. We feel electric rate payers don't need or want to be at great risk due to the habits of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Please change your ways. Nuclear is not the way to go. While we have geothermal, solar, and wind, and who knows what else. Waste, confidence, I have no waste confidence. Thank you. Is Sherry Katz here? Sherry? that you can still submit comments online. I know we're having to cut time short, and I'm very sorry that we have to do that to get through everybody, but you can still submit comments online or by email or in writing. There's many other ways to comment. Um, and also, if everyone could please check their cell phones real quick and make sure that they're, that they're off. How many more? Um, about 15 left. Oh, no. For our next speakers, let's go to Leanne Caston, Stephanie Belenko, and Lisa Donovan. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not have Lisa down to speak, sorry. This is Leanne.
Can you hear me? Yes. 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 My name is Leanne Caston. I am a journalist and author. I'm going to tell you for a second about my breast cancer book. Two elements create nuclear, to create breast cancer. I won't go into the first, the second is nuclear radiation. I can only quickly tell you that after 10 years, the women in Nagasaki developed a mass of breast cancer. It's a long-term effect. It doesn't immediately pop up. You will see it eventually if you have been exposed over a period of time. Therefore, I'm going to start out by telling you this is an issue of madness. Dealing with a dangerous technology, dangerous, notwithstanding the words safe, it isn't. It's a dangerous technology that costs way too much, that threatens the lives of thousands of people, that generates poisons even in low-level emissions, that generates lies and false statements to lull the public into their sense of safety as a clean technology and nuclear power is not that we lull ourselves into denial to justify our cool homes while corporate executives uh, pay home their salaries and while millions and millions of dollars are invested in this technology. While PR firms promote this technology and frankly, it's become a mad world. Anytime we think it's okay to allow some exposure to radiation through accidents which are many or any releases and anytime someone is harmed, that's evil. Let's deal with facts. After Chernobyl, I heard the Russian equivalent of the EPA come to America to warn us about the dangers, the dangers of nuclear radiation. He talked about the thousands of people who were harmed and died. Thousands. He finally actually admitted that there were millions, and he also admitted the Russian government lied. They didn't want to admit this, they were avoiding it, and he died two years later. He was involved with cleanup. No human life is expendable or collateral damage. No one. Accidents will happen. No one must deny this. How can anyone justify harming just one human being when less toxic, more sustainable technology is available? This whole mindset is morally indefensible. If I take a gun and randomly shoot bullets into a crowd, I'd be called insane, criminal, and evil. This technology is no less. Let's just stop making the waste. Thank you, and next we'll go to Stephanie Belenko. My name is Stephanie Blanco, and I am part of the Near West Citizens for Peace and Justice. Uh, that group is part of a larger group of the Illinois Coalition for Peace, Justice, and the Environment. Illinois is not a waste dump. We don't want any more high-level radioactive waste coming to or through Illinois. Nuclear waste is still a problem without a solution. No technology has been proven capable of containing radioactive waste for the hundreds of thousands of years necessary to protect the environment. Debates continue over whether it is even possible to do so, but unfortunately the United States has failed even to identify a viable site for a nuclear waste repository despite billions of dollars and a federal mandate to do so. Mass transportation of nuclear waste is unsafe. 
The sheer volume of nuclear waste will require thousands of shipments on our roads, rails, and waterways. Nationwide, there is well over 8,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel, with plutonium that will remain toxic for 240,000 years. Other elements in irradiated fuel will be dangerously radioactive for even longer. No storage facility has been designed that can contain radioactive waste for such periods. Since spent nuclear fuel contains large quantities of fissile fuel or fissile material, that can be used to make nuclear weapons, so it also must be safeguarded to prevent theft. Proponents of nuclear power treat the radioactive waste as a minor matter. It is not. A nuclear fission reactor produces waste so lethal that it has to be isolated from the rest of existence for a quarter of a million years. In theory, containing high-level waste is possible. In practice, Murphy's Law is the safer guide. In the real world, it is certain that sooner or later, things go wrong. By accident or cussedness of nature, that waste is going to leak into the biosphere. And once that happens, anyone ha and anything that comes into contact with even a few milligrams of it will suffer a miserable death. The more nuclear power we generate now, the more of this ghastly gift will be stockpiling for the people of the far future. A basic concept of morality is that each of us ought to leave the world a better place for those who come after us. If we know better, we ought to do better. One of the essential boundaries of appropriate tech is the boundary between, between the kinds of matter you can change with tools you have on hand and the kinds you can. And if you can't change it into something safe, it's a bad idea to produce it in the first place. It really is that simple. If you can't transform it, don't produce it. Radioactivity from atomic power will pose a threat to life on the Earth for the next million years. We are confident that NRC and the waste generators can never contain this waste for as long as it poses a hazard. But to continue making more of it is not just insane. It is irresponsible and should be illegal. NRC must abandon its waste confidence policy and stop using it to license nuclear power plants. There is no safe dose of radiation, and to pursue licensing it on the base of waste confidence is immoral. And now, and now I'm speaking as a citizen mother. We need you to go ahead and wrap up, please. Okay. For our children's future, no more nuclear power. These are my grandchildren. to Joyce Good, Claire Tobin, and Robert Schwartz. Is Joyce still here? Yeah, I'm still here. I don't want to say much. I have to play. Poland. He constantly gets ill. 
he does not know how to solve. That is not a safety feature. That's a fact. And that's a fact we have to look at. And we have to look starkly at it. Now, the young lady who came up uh, from Exelon, all the people from Exelon, thank you. You're very nice. I like you. I'm sorry you work for Exelon. And I'm glad your um, organization and company provides you with experiences that you feel make things safe. Exelon has been cited many times for doing wrong things. So don't forget that. But they have never put you in a situation with a tornado or a typhoon or an earthquake. How about that for pools of radioactive waste? You've never experienced that. So you really can't stand up and say confidently, they have done everything and I do feel safe. And lastly, I'd like to say, 60 years from now, you're going to have a repository? That is totally irresponsible. A repository should be now. And the other part that should be now, to reiterate what my good friends have said, is stop producing this highly dangerous waste. We are people. We want to live. Give us a chance. Thank you. But the history of the nuclear age is not like that. It started off with, uh, with a bomb. And that is more than 60 years ago. And then it was sold as a peaceful um, way of getting uh, you know, nuclear energy. That it was a peaceful thing. But it's still a horrible, toxic, dangerous process. And if we haven't found a solution to the waste after 60 years, what confidence do you have that we will have the, have the gumption to solve it now? No, we don't. It's just like the government, once it starts on one direction, it's so difficult to, to change it. And all the subsidies that you're getting for, for it, why can't we put those subsidies into good renewable energy? All that money, we could be free, and we could be healthy, and we could be safe, and so with our children. And for you young people they are working, I would implore you to read this book, Full Body Burden, by Kristen Iverson, who worked in the 60s and 70s in Rocky Mountain Flats, or whatever you call that, dump. And, and the, the, the number of commissions, and the secrecy, and the illnesses, and the cover-up, and all of the, the hearings that were heard, and that went nowhere. And she, her life is a testimony. And all the people who were sick, and who got ill, you gotta, you gotta wake up and read those. And let us be courageous, and do what we need to do, and is move away from nuclear forever. It's dead. Followed by Fran Seal. I apologize if I mispronounced that. I'm having a hard time reading some of the writing. And also Bridget Rorum. I'm Robert Schwartz. And I do have confidence in the NRC's rulemaking and policies and procedures. I reside at, well, with this crowd, I don't think I'm going to tell you where I reside at. <laughs> but as the crow flies, I live eight miles downwind of present nuclear power plant. And there's nuclear spent fuel storage gas there and have been there for years. And my jaw's not wired shut, and I haven't lost any tea fever. I feel safe that the fuel is stored safely and not a threat to my safety or my family's. And I live downhill of the casks. And I represent bottom makers, and we held the casks. 
I have witnessed the fuel of the turning of the casks. I have witnessed the welding of the cast, and I witnessed the inner cast being put in the outer cast, and I witnessed the two feet of concrete, the neutron absorbing concrete, poured around the inner cast, and the outer lid welded on. I have all the confidence that the NRC's design and engineering will keep the fuel safely stored. The welding criteria is of the most stringent standards. Each inch is videotaped and reviewed. The cast is made of neutron absorbing material. I have confidence in the NRC's expertise to continue to develop policies and procedures to protect us as they have done in the past. And I'm not moving. And I challenge a previous speaker who contested the safety of the cast and the building of the cast in the parking lot after this meeting. Thank you. <laughs> It took almost nine years, however, for the NRC to begin assessing the potential risk at existing reactors that were already operating in seismic areas. In 2005, um, NRC identified its 27 most vulnerable reactors. Two of these are in Illinois, the two Dresden units, and eight years later, there still has not been any corrective action on those. You know, in this world where, you know, and, and I, don't think any, I, I don't think anybody in the room disagrees that there is a high risk of nuclear fission. It, it's like a, the, every conceivable effort has to be made to assure that absolutely nothing goes wrong. The feds have designated the authority for our, the safety of our nation's nuclear plants exclusively to the NRC. All right, there are some questions about their track record of doing that. 
So regardless of how hard you're working in these plants, um, there's there's questions, there's serious questions. Can we just share and finish up? Thank you. So um, the league does not have confidence in the NRC's waste confidence. Draft generic environmental um, safety thing. And um, the document should be thoroughly revised on the basis of an objective, a review of scientific data, which includes NRC's own performance data and the critical public data. And I have been observing that you, you differentially um, are kind of applying. I know we're at the end of the evening now, but I have been noticing differences in the way people are. And our next speaker is Bridget Morrows, followed by William Jones.
which for some isotopes contained in high level waste can take hundreds of thousands of years. The waste must be stored in a way that provides adequate protection for very long times. But at this time, there are no facilities for permanent storage. That actually comes from the NRC website. Um, so the industry and uh, the industry folks and the politicians who spoke tonight and, and who stand to personally gain from nuclear power through their paychecks and other, other issues are, taking, are talking about the next 50 to 100 years. Um, and even, even that, they cannot predict um, what is the future of, uh, as Fukushima has taught us. So my question, based on the NRC's own figure, I have a bunch of them, actually. Um, does the NRC have a plan for the next 250,000 years of nuclear waste storage, management, and disaster response? Does the NRC have a financial plan to manage nuclear waste for 250,000 years? Is the NRC prepared to fund potential disasters for the next 250,000 years? Does the NRC feel confident that it has taken all factors of climate change, change into its 250,000 year plan, um, which would include predicted water shortages, um, superstorms, increased uh, flooding and droughts? Has the NRC planned for the likely population explosion over the next few hundred years? Considering how fracking has been proven by the USGS to induce earthquakes and previously inactive faults, has the NRC figured a way to predict that future generations won't be fracking in the region of nuclear waste storage? Can the NRC prove that humans will be in existence in 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 years to manage this waste? The problem with nuclear, says Hubert Reeves, an astrophysicist, is that it mortgages the future. Between the time you launch a reactor plant and the time you dismantle it, more than a century can go by. Has a political regime been able to last more than a century? There are very few of them in, this, in history. We can't talk about political stability on the scale of a thousand years. Imagine the Egyptians had stored nuclear waste. Who would manage it today? It's outrageous to think we can manage the future in such times as these when we look at the history of mankind and all its changes and upheavals. It's totally outrageous, end quote. Can the NRC morally defend its position of bequeathing the problem of radioactive waste for thousands of years. The hubris we have as humans to leave this legacy of waste for 6,000 human generations, for a single generation's comfort. It is immoral and arrogant, and I have no confidence that the NRC represents the interests of the future of life on this planet. Thank you. Then we'll go to Terry Gallagher. Good evening. I'm the Reverend Dr. Terry Gallagher. I'm a public theologian with the Ministry for a Sustainable Earth. And first of all, I want to express my gratitude that you all stuck through this this long have this kind of a conversation to kind of explore where we're at and where we're going. I appreciate the NRC offering us and inviting us to discuss. You know, as a theologian, I often remark it's interesting that every major world religion has some form of the golden rule. Every single major world religion has some form of don't do unto others that you would want done unto you. There's something about that that just resonates with our humanity that we're called to care for others, that we're called to care beyond short-term economics, that we're called to care for future. So I'm here to speak for future. And I'm here to tell you it's unethical to require future generations to handle the waste of the generation. It's unethical to put this burden on future generations. We wouldn't have wanted it done to us. Where do we get off thinking that we have the right to do it to others? So the short-term approach of handling with nuclear waste is unethical. It's not viable. 
If we're going to have nuclear power, then we need to be honest and face it and handle it within our generation. The answer is we haven't found a way to do that yet. So until we do, we need to stop. It's unethical to put our generation under future generations. It's in our humanity. We're addicted to cheap fossil fuel and cheap power. We need to look beyond short-term economics. We need to think about what is truly human about us and what we would want future generations to have to bear because we want it to like something. There's other ways to do it. Thanks for having us.
I remember adults telling me in fourth grade that I should hide under my desk to protect myself from nuclear fallout. In eighth grade, I didn't understand yet, and I built a model of a nuclear reactor as a science fair project. It wasn't until I sought to build a working model that the dangers of nuclear energy became clear to me. While earning my engineering degree, I learned that no accelerated test is valid without data from a non-accelerated test. I'm concerned that life test data for existing plants in Illinois is not available, and that this data is only now being generated as the licenses for these plants are extended. Without it, we're guessing. In the late 80s, I worked for a company that designed and built control valves. The valves designed by my older colleagues for the nuclear industry were already antiquated, and the redundancy in the designs struck me as Rube Goldberg embarrassments to satisfy bureaucratic requirements to make a fundamentally dangerous process appear safe. Perhaps the most alarming evidence I've seen convincing me to oppose this GEIS is the excessive confidence demonstrated by the comments of some of the enthusiastic employees here tonight. None have broken yet is an unsafe approach to terrestrial nuclear power, and it ignores basic engineering discipline. I'd be less concerned if more had a healthy fear. I find the term generic environmental an oxymoron. <laughs> Environment is the essence of site variability. So I find the proposition absurd to reject any GEIS for nuclear waste. Without a waste solution, like everybody else has said, I oppose creation of more nuclear waste. I see few in this room who will be around to fulfill the, the uh, promises to replace casks in 60 or 100 years, let alone 250,000 years. I've seen promises to protect public, the public abandoned in the face of extreme events, and the increasingly extreme weather events we can expect to occur more frequently from climate destruction gives me pause. NRC should stop jeopardizing future citizens without their consent and should not be allowed to issue new licenses or extensions. Thank you. Carly Grace and Saman Shafi. Shafi. Okay, thank you. So Carly Grace, is Carly? TVs, 
You're darn right we may have to do without some stuff. It's either that or a plant. I don't know about you. I, I don't have kids. Do you have kids? Do you have grandchildren? I have me, and I've lived a good life, and I'm grateful for that. But we are depriving the future. When the Pacific is already trash, it's not a bathtub. Who's going to be drinking that water? Who's going to surf in it? Who's going to fish in it? I want this safety to go right to the heart of it. Go back and live in Chernobyl. Go back to Three Mile Island and see that damage. There is moral integrity that is missing, and this shouldn't even be a conversation because this shouldn't even have to be on the board for a discussion. The water resources that are going to be so very terribly at risk that it takes to keep anything cooled. All right, is it going to be let's cool the plant or let's have some water to drink? All you have to do is look at what happens in the Philippines when you have people without water. And you can be smug and laugh that I want you to sign up right now and go to Fukushima. Those of you who have been sitting here laughing and just chuckling at this need to be doing some soul searching while you still have a soul left, while there is a planet for us to inhabit. There isn't a plan B. And you can only go underground for so many years if you think you've got that kind of self-repository filled with food. You come up, and there won't be anything. I do not support and have absolutely no confidence. And when there was a slight mishap here, I got involved because I called the governors, I called the senators, they didn't know what had happened. I called and they said, talk to the DOE. DOE says you've got to talk to emergency management. They have no clue. I did not like have people just pretending I was some stupid idiot. I am not, and neither is the rest of this planet. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Beverly Walter. I think that toward the end of the right. Excuse me. <laughs> well, I'm Beverly Walter and I'm with a number of groups. Some of you are in the state groups I'm in, um, NEIS, uh, Kapow, and West Suburban um, our Coalition for Peace and Justice. All of you, I want to thank for your comments. I hope they are heard, not just push aside. I don't want this to be shown. And all of you lovely people who work for the industry, I can appreciate that you would support the industry. But I think it is a statement of where we are at that almost everyone, except maybe one person who has testified on behalf of this, and on behalf of the NRC, are with the industry. Now that should tell us something. That should tell us that they are not speaking for the public. And that those people who are here, who have spoken before me, who are incredibly knowledgeable, are the ones that are speaking in facts. Not claims, but facts. And I think that's what we should listen to. And I want to quote, although there's a lot that could be said, a lot of it is already being said, what it needs to be is taken to heart. And I urge those members of the NRC to remind themselves that they also are people and that their mission is to serve the people of this country and beyond that of the planet and not the business. Let's repeat that. They are there to serve the people. Let us remind them of that. And if they do not serve the people, they are betraying their job, they are betraying their country, and they are betraying their planet. 
And let us remind ourselves that this technology, which is being so touted by some of the members as so safe, has demonstrably been proven unsafe. And in addition to that, it is an old technology, isn't it? Isn't it time we really look and say, hey, let's move into the 21st century. Let's decrease our consumption. Let's not be pigs about how much energy we use or waste. Let's turn to renewables because we can. And all of the engineers and all of the safety people, you can have a marvelous career, a green career in solar, in geothermal, in all the kinds of even coal fusion, all these incredible kinds of discoveries that have been suppressed. We have a future to look for. Let's turn our back on a technology that is dangerous, that is poisoning people and the planet, and let's move to the future. The in nuclear industry has gotten millions, billions of dollars from the U.S. taxpayers. Let's put that into renewables. Let's look to the future. Thank you. Thank you.
Do we still have Frank Costanza? Frank Costanza, and then Hannah Welsh. Is Hannah here? Please, no sign. That's, um, that's pretty much all. I think we have to stop doing it, and I don't know the solution to all that. The only non-detrimental source of energy that we have, I think, is photosynthesis, and uh, we seem to have moved beyond that for some reason, even though it seems to be a really good system. So, uh, I don't think I should say anything else, because I'm tired and I think everyone else is. Thank you. Thank you. Is Hannah here? That concludes the list of people that I had signed up to speak. Is there anyone who didn't already get a chance to speak that, that wanted to come up and your name wasn't on the list?
for perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, things that are happening right now at this conference, and yet almost nobody has known about it. And on top of that, even though no one has gotten the word out, I think it's worth noting that there's an overwhelming majority of support here for people who are against nuclear waste, containing this nuclear issue. The only people that have really shown up here are representing the industry that are in favor. They all have a bias because they're getting paid. There's a profit motive there. Pretty much unanimously, all the people who are not getting any money are against this proposition. I think that should be stated for the record. I also personally think that the title of this, the Waste Confidence, is very misleading. That's kind of an Orwellian title so that no one can really get an understanding of what's happening right here. We're talking about nuclear waste dumping. If you're not putting that in the terms it is, no one's going to know what you're talking about, and people aren't going to come out and express themselves. So I think that just the title itself shows a certain lack of transparency that we need to look at. How can we have confidence in the system when they're getting, using words like waste confidence? We need to have a very descriptive title of what's going on so people can have a real understanding, and then we can have an honest debate. Furthermore, I'd like to say that I think it's a bad idea. We can't put this burden on other generations. It can't be a burden for people 250,000 years down the line. That's just totally irresponsible, immoral, unethical. You know, for people said it brilliantly that, you know, for one generation's worth of energy consumption, we're creating a lifelong problem for hundreds of thousands of years. Human civilization is not that long. I believe Deborah mentioned, like, what if the Egyptians were using nuclear waste? Would you want to be responsible for maintaining that waste disposal in modern times and for generations and generations to come. I think if you do the math, you'll realize that it's not economically efficient, it's not safe, it's not wise. We need to take that money and we need to reinvest it into renewable energy, renewable rates, uh, resources. That's the way to go for the future. Thank you. Dr. Mohamed for his closing remarks. Thanks everybody for coming this evening. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for your participation tonight. Thanks for coming. I know it takes uh, an effort to come out, particularly on the whole night. And also, thanks for staying within the, uh, the three minute time, a three minute time limit. That really helps uh, everybody uh, in terms of allowing everybody to speak. So, thanks again, and we'll close the meeting. Good night. Waiting for us come to Jesus moments. <laughs> <laughs>